Good morning. This is the City Planning Commission public meeting held in held at NYC City Planning Commission here in room Lower Concourse 120 Broadway. Today is July 25th, 2018. As a courtesy during the proceedings, we ask that you please turn off all cell phones and beepers. All speakers should fill out a speaker's card. In addition, we ask that those providing testimony please identify yourself, limit your remarks to three minutes, and speak clearly into the microphone. I will now call the roll. Chair Lago. Here. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Here. Commissioner Capelli. Here. Commissioner Cerullo. Here. Commissioner De La Uz. Here. Commissioner Dweck. Here. Commissioner Edie. Here. Commissioner Efron. Here. Commissioner Knight. Commissioner Levin. Here. Commissioner Marin. Here. Commissioner Ortiz. Here. A quorum is present. The first item is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of Wednesday, July 11, 2018. On the minutes, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Minutes approved. On <coughs> scheduling, on calendar numbers one through nine, we have resolutions for adoption. Scheduling Wednesday, August 8, 2018, for a public hearing to be held at NYC City Planning Commission Hearing Room, Lower Concourse, 120 Broadway. On the resolutions, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Resolutions adopted. The next part of the calendar is the report section on page 12. Borough of the Bronx, calendar numbers 10, 11, and 12. Calendar number 10, CD8, N180374ZAX. Calendar number 11, N180375ZAX. Calendar number 12, N180376ZAX. In the matter of applications for the grant of authorizations concerning the College of Monk St. Vincent Residence Hall Nursing School. For adoption on calendar numbers 10, 11, and 12. Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Uz? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Calendar numbers 11, 10, 11, and 12 have been adopted. <coughs> Borough of Brooklyn, calendar number 13 and 14. <clears throat> Calendar number 13, CD2, C170164, ZMK. Calendar number 14, N170165, ZRK. In the matter of applications for a zoning map and zoning tax amendment concerning 205 Park Avenue rezoning. For favorable reports on calendar numbers 20, I mean 14 and 13 and 14. Madam Chair? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. <coughs> Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Uz? Um, I'm going to abstain on, on these actions, not because I don't believe the developer's been responsive to a number of concerns, but primarily because I believe the city can do more to appropriately balance uh, the public and private benefits in these M to R rezonings. Um, in the balance of the block um, where this project is being proposed, um, you know, navy green was used as an example to, to justify the change in use. I just want to point out that that project was predominantly affordable. Um, and, and in general, in these MDR rezonings, the 25 to 30 percent affordable housing really um, isn't sufficient. Um, I'm also struck by this site being one block from um, the, the Brooklyn Navy Yard and there being a long list, wait list of manufacturing businesses that are seeking to um, have space in the area. So with that, I'm going to abstain. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Levin? I certainly share Commissioner Deleuze's concerns, um, but we'll vote yes on this one. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Favorable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers 13 and 14. Borough of Brooklyn, calendar number 15, CD3, C150252, PQK. In the matter of an application for the acquisition of property concerning the LSSNY Early Life Center for a favorable report on calendar number 15. Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner De La Uz? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 15. 
Borrow Brooklyn calendar numbers 16 and 17. Calendar number 16, CD 6C170047, ZMK. Calendar number 17, N170046, ZRK. In the matter of applications for a zoning map and zoning text amendment concerning 55-63 Summit Street rezoning. For favorable reports on calendar numbers 16 and 17, Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Dela Recused. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Favorable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers 16 and 17. Borough of Brooklyn, calendar number 18, CD6, C180256, PQK. In the matter of an application for the acquisition of property concerning NYPD evidence storage Erie Basin. For favorable reports on um, favorable report on calendar number 18, Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Dela Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? I hope that the uh, evidence is uh, removed um, carefully and promptly from the floodplain where it resides currently on pallets. Um, and with that, I vote yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 18. Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 19, CD5, C180. 296 PCM in the matter of an application for the site selection and acquisition of property concerning the NYPD bomb squad headquarters for a favorable report on calendar number 19 Chair Lago. Yes Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Capelli. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner Dela Us. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Uh, yeah, I appreciate the follow-up we got from DCAS on this application and I vote yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number 19. Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 20, CD 10, N180372, HKM. In the matter of a communication concerning a landmark designation of the Central Harlem West 130th through 132nd Street Historic District. For adoption on calendar number 20 for referral to the City Council, Chair Largo? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Dela Us? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Calendar number 20 has been adopted. Bar of Queens, calendar number 21, CD 14, N180440, HIQ. In the matter of a communication concerning the landmark designation of the engine companies 264 and 228, ladder company 134. On the adoption of calendar numbers 21, <clears throat> on calendar number 21 for referral to the City Council. Chair Largo? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Uh, yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Dela Us? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Calendar number 21 has been adopted. Borough of Queens, calendar number 22, <coughs> CD 14, N180449, HIQ. In the matter of a communication concerning the landmark designation of the 53rd Precinct Station House on the adoption of calendar number 22 for referral to the City Council. Chair Largo? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Dela Us? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Edie? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Sorry. Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Calendar number 22 has been adopted. Borough of Staten Island, calendar number 23, CD1C160401, ZMR, in the matter of an application for a zoning map amendment concerning 5B Ment Avenue for adoption for a favorable report on calendar number 23. Chair Largo? Yes. 
Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Delaus? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Calendar number 23 has been adopted. Commissioner Knight has joined. Sorry. Commissioner Knight on calendar number 23. Yes, and I would like to vote yes for the previous projects. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. Borrow Staten Island, calendar number 24, CD3, N180286 RCR, in the matter of an application for the grant of a certification concerning 19 High Mount Road for adoption of calendar number 24. Chair Lago? Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cerullo? Yes. Commissioner Delauz? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Calendar number 24 has been adopted. Borrow of Staten Island, calendar number 25, CD2, N120395, ZAR, in the matter of an application for the grant of an authorization concerning six. 661 Todd Hill Road for adoption on calendar number 25. <coughs> Chair Largo? Yes. Vice Chair Knuckles? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner, De La Commissioner Cerullo? Um, yes, I would just like to take a moment to acknowledge the follow up from the Staten Island office staff on, on this item and the information that confirms the fact that there is an approved builder's pavement plan from DOT already filed and that um, that plan does both require improvements to the property that goes into the road and that um, there is also being required by DOT um, a dedication of public use for that uh, property. So with that, I vote yes. Commissioner De La Uz? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Efron? Yes. Commissioner Knight? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Calendar number 25 has been adopted. The next part of the calendar is the public hearing section on page 20, 25. Borrow of the Bronx, calendar number 26, 26 CD 10. N180398 BDX, a public hearing in the matter of an application concerning the form formation of the Charles Neck Business Improvement District. Speaker will be Michael Blaze Backer. I'm joined by Roxanne, Roxanne Early, Director of the Bid Program, and Lamel Lindsay, Senior Program Manager for Bid Development. And we're here to testify in support of the establishment of the Throgs Nag Business Improvement District in the Bronx. At SBS, we are working hard to open doors for New Yorkers across the five boroughs, focusing on creating stronger businesses, connecting New Yorkers to good jobs, and fostering thriving neighborhoods. We believe that the vitality of the city's commercial corridors is a key part of achieving this goal, and bids have been valuable and proven partners in small business support, neighborhood revitalization, and economic development across the five boroughs. In addition to our role overseeing and supporting the city's existing network of 75 bids, SBS also supervises bid formation and the expansion process, serving as an advisor and resource for communities interested in planning and expanding bids. We are careful to ensure that each steering committee we work with adheres to our planning processes and policies, solicits robust community input, and performs extensive outreach to collect and demonstrate broad-based support all across all stakeholder groups. Moreover, we are cognizant of the unique nature of each community we assist and aim to empower local stakeholders and make determinations on the proposed services, the proposed boundaries, and the budget size that best suit their community's needs and their appetite and ability to pay the assessment. While we always impart strong planning principles and share our data and best practices from across the bid network when working with any bid formation or expansion effort, we recognize that the power and effectiveness of bids rests in their unmatched understanding of local needs and issues. 
After an extensive outreach effort by the steering committee, SBS determined that the documented support among all stakeholder groups, including over 50% of the area's total assessed value signing in favor, was sufficient to submit the application to city planning. Levels of support and response rates for the proposed Throgs Neck bid are in line with other recent bid formation efforts supported by the commission and city council. It is also important to note that this bid formation effort has received written support from council member Mark Jonai and Bronx Community Board 10. The proposed Throgs Neck bid, which would be the 11th bid in the Bronx, has met SBS's prerequisites for bid formation and we believe the bid will improve business conditions and quality of life in the area. Therefore, SBS supports the establishment of the Throgs Neck bid. This time, happy to take any questions. Questions from the commission. Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, I had some questions at review session that I think you're probably best poised to answer. Um, just some uh, questions I, I noticed in the um, district plan that um, there was a clause um, that, you know, no assessment dollars can be used to fund facade or storefront improvement programs. And I, I know it's not in the standard SBS template for district council. So I was curious why and whether, you know, I, it's such an important piece of what bids can do. And I wonder why it's off the table. Here. Yeah, well, actually, it's something we've been building into district plans for uh, quite some time now, or at least I would say five to six years. Um, my understanding, so bid law essentially only allows bid assessment dollars to be spent on in the public realm and not to uh, you know, improve or benefit any private property owner. So there was, um, I, I wanna say six years ago or so, before my time at SBS, there was um, some clarification on this from the law department to, and SBS that essentially just clarified that with storefront improvement, if you actually want to provide an actual physical grant dollar to both either a tenant or a property owner, that that would need to be done with sort of outside private dollars or fundraising that bid assessment dollars could not be used for the grant purpose. Okay, so that's a reflection of our, our understanding of, of the enabling legislation. Correct. Okay, so just then the clarification, can borrowed money um, be used then for any of those purposes? Um, borrowed, I mean, I certainly, I guess not if it were going to be paid off by the assessment itself, but I suppose yeah, if borrowed right. money okay. were going to be paid off by a revenue generating enterprise, I guess that would be theoretically possible. Okay. Um, thank you. Yes, Commissioner Eady. Yeah, uh, good morning. Um, good morning. In our material, it talks about the support from the commercial properties, and it has 58% of the assessed value of property owners supporting this and 52% of the commercial tenants. I just want to make sure that the balance of those numbers weren't people in opposition. If you can speak to that, where is it just no response or? Yeah, yeah, uh, there, yes, the majority, the large majority, and this is not uncommon in most in bid formation efforts. It's really quite challenging to get uh, responses from from those who are perhaps no. Um, not physically present in the district. So in this case, um, I, I could defer to my uh, further uh, testimony from one of the steering committee members, the exact numbers, but um, they actually had an incredibly high response rate in this case, something where um, we really commend them for their effort. But in that case, the majority, it's not that they're, the 42% is not that they responded in opposition, but that the majority did not respond. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Levin. Uh, yeah, I have a question about the proposed bid budget. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe for you or maybe for someone from the steering committee is going to speak to us later. Um, and that's about the amount that's allocated for administration, roughly $44,000. Is that um, seems pretty modest if that has a human being attached to it? So, what was that last part, sorry? It, it, it seems like a modest amount if it's a full-time employee. So uh, what's the plan for staffing? Yeah, so, you know, I'll be honest, like, we've, it's been tricky to find the right format for a budget in, the, in a district plan because it really is just the first-year budget, and I think we, we work with bids when we do our, um, our annual trends report um, to really see how bids are allocating their personnel, especially like their ED or any sort of administrative staff. And in, in many nonprofits, it's certainly best practice to kind of allocate those salaries across programmatic I expenses. See, okay. So in cases like this, and I, again, I, I don't think we found like the perfect format yet for a district plan, um, but that is the case where certainly there's some ED salary typically in an administrative general, uh, general administrative line, and then there's still certainly some built into both 
marketing or maintenance expense lines. Okay, so what is the headcount anticipated for this bid? Do you know? Um, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't think that decision would have necessarily been made yet. I think um, given the budget size, I wouldn't, ex you know, I would assume one full-time staff and potentially more part-time or maybe even a second. I think that really is something we okay. leave generally to the board. But this is not, we've seen other bids where there are shared administrative staff. This is not one of those? We wouldn't anticipate um, that. I would, I would, um, I think I've said that this, uh, the, the commission before, that we've certainly made every effort to ensure that when we're forming new bids that they have the capacity to at least have one full-time staff member because we see that as a real ne necessity right. to get the sort of broader advocacy um, role that we see but bids that playing. Was, that was the gist of my concern too, so thank you. Sure. Vice Chair Knuckles. No, just to follow up on uh, Commissioner Levin's point, I think uh, your colleague from uh, SBS said on Monday that a portion of the uh, budget allocated for advocacy, the 80,000, mm -hmm. some portion of that would be used for administration? Because if not, I, I share my colleague's concern about 40. Yes. $44,000. That is correct. I, I, I think, again, that term, um, sometimes it is lumped together, general administration and advocacy, because sort of the nature of advocacy in a bid, especially of a bid of this size, typically comes from the executive director themselves and, so, uh, and the role they play in interacting with city agencies and elected officials. So that would be built in. Commissioner Ortiz. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephen Kaufman. Um, good morning, Madam Chair and fellow commissioners. My name is Stephen Kaufman, and I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the proposed Throgs Neck bid in the Bronx. As a former president of the Throgs Neck Merchants Association and now legal counsel, I can truly say that we are blessed to have a great merchants association. Several years ago, the members of the merchants association were both saddened and frustrated to see the Tremont commercial corridor within the Throgs Neck neighborhood surrounded by the development of big chains such as Target to the North and the Co-op City Mall, one of the largest indoor malls in the country nearby. In response to these changes, the Throgs Neck Merchants formed a steering committee in 2014 and proposed to establish a bid along East Tremont Avenue from Bruckner Boulevard to the north to Miles Avenue in the south. Over the past few years, the Throgs Neck Steering Committee, in coordination with the New York City Small Business Services, has worked diligently through the bid formation process. Throughout this process, the steering committee held numerous public meetings, distributed surveys, identifying local challenges, sent ballots to every stakeholder in the district, published notifications in several local newspapers, and engaged st stakeholders in person. As a result of our efforts, the Throgs Net Bid Formation effort received support from over 50% of the area's total assessed value. On behalf of the Throgs Neck Steering Committee, we ask for your support today so Throgs Neck can continue to be a vibrant commercial corridor. Many folks in our community, including the overwhelming support from merchants, feel that a bid and its ability to enhance our community and advocate on our behalf is necessary for our success. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to us. I may be able to answer two of your questions very quickly. The personnel, we've allocated about $105,000. We have $70,000 for an employee, $10,000 for accountant, $30,000 for rent, and $5,500 for miscellaneous. So we have $115,000 allocated for that purpose. And the interesting thing is that this bubbled up from the merchants knowing they would have to pay an assessment. There were 275 commercial tenants in the area, 172 voted, 144 voted yes, only 28 voted no. Of the 28 who voted no, 23 were controlled by one naysayer. So if you remove that naysayer, practically no merchant who knew they would be getting an increased assessment voted against this plan. So I'm pleased to tell you that the merchants who will eventually be footing the bill voted overwhelmingly in favor of it. 
Thank you. Questions for Mr. Kaufman. And Madam Secretary, is the timer not working? It's working, Madam Chair. He was answering a question. He said I'm answering a question. Okay, again, let us know when the time runs out, please. Okay. Other questions? Yes, Vice Chair Knuckles. Good to see you. Former Deputy Borough President, the man who knows the Tremont Corridor, and the Board of Estimates. I was making fun you're, you're, with some of the old times you're about dating that. Me. You're dating me. I know. <laughs> Unfortunately, time waits for no man. Right. Um, from your vantage point, what's the, the highest one or two priorities of the bid? What would they be if it is approved? Well, the horrible thing that's afflicting us is being surrounded by the malls. They've come in, and you can't get parking in our area. And we need to rejuvenate and regenerate our strip because we're having a lot of vacancies and we'd like to have a different mix of tenants, market the place, have some clean, cleaning services with beautification. An architect for free did a streetscape for us. We have a streetscape plan ready to go if we can get the funding for it. So I think we have to make it look nicer, uh, beautify it, and have an advocate for the merchants who feel that they are being neglected. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions for Mr. Kaufman? Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Robert Jean. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and fellow commissioners. My name is Bob Jean. I am the Throgs Neck Merchants President. And um, I'd like to have the opportunity to testify on behalf of the proposed Throgs Neck bid in the Bronx. For the past 18 months, I've been the Throgs Neck Merchants Association President. And for four years prior to that, I was on the executive board as the new members coordinator. In that time, I've seen a lot of changes in our commercial corridor. We are a hardworking blue collar area. We are filled with a lot of different cultures and traditions, but when hard times come, we always pull for each other. We've given on, on, uh, ourselves a nickname called the Throgs Neck Strong. Going forward, we want to continue to be uh, a mom and pop personal business area. For me, you can't beat it. When you stop in Throgs Neck, we give our community a unique shopping experience by providing excellent customer service and doing our best to address the neighborhood's needs. Unfortunately, we have a lot of competition around us, such as the Co-op City Mall and other big chains in the area. However, we feel the opportunity to have a build, bid will help our commercial area continue to thrive. With a bid, we hope to make our streets cleaner, more beautiful, beautify the area, and provide marketing for our community. Over the past two years, our community has come a very long way, and we wish to continue and grow in Throgs Neck strong. Thank you for the, giving me the opportunity to testify. And just a couple of things that um, I had, uh, three of the things that I look forward to seeing in, in the future is uh, security cameras up and down the corridor, which is good for everybody. Lighting, I think uh, our lighting is the worst in any commercial corridor. And uh, I've, sit, I've sat out in front of buildings and seen people walking down the street with their children in carriages, and it, it, it bothers me. Um, that there's something that we can do. And the other thing is the streetscape. Like uh, my predecessor, Steve Kaufman, said, uh, we do have plans to make beautiful streetscapes. And it's not expensive. It's just that you have to put the work in. And um, I believe that with the team of people that, that I have and the people on the steering committee and whoever the bid director is going to be, uh, I think we can, we can make major, major improvements in our area. You know, like I say, when you come to my neighborhood, you know, it's hello, how are you, how are the children, you know, do you still want the gabagool or do you want the provolone? You know, because we know, we know everybody. And I want other people from other areas to experience that because we are a good, hardworking blue collar. And uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Throgs next strong? <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Efron. First, a compliment to say it's really wonderful to hear about a community binding together in the face of the uh, sort of uncertain times in retail. Um, and toward that end, as the former new, new member coordinator, can you give us a sense, as people who look at retail throughout the city and high vacancy rates, what the pace of new um, members of the bid, of, of the Merchant Association well, has been? 
as, like I said, as of January of last year, I became president. And in the 18 months, we've uh, added 30% to our enrollment. And I'm very proud to say that 17% of the members of the Throgs Neck Merchants Association don't come from Throgs Neck. They come from outside the area. We have uh, people from uh, Pelham. We have some people from Westchester. They just like the, what we're doing. They like the overall business plan that we have in process, and I think it can only get better. Uh, we have um, a lot of the mom and pop stores, like I say, I, I see them every day, and um, they're excited to now become members. New entrepreneurs call me all the time, coming from outside Westchester, Jersey I have. I have a meeting with two people next week from Connecticut that are looking to put a, a footprint in the neighborhood. And I don't think that anybody would invest hundreds of thousands of dollars into a neighborhood where they're not going to see it a return on their money. And I think part of that is because of the work that we do. We, we're not about politics, we're about economics. And if I see my next door neighbor doing better, hopefully I'll do better. If a new person comes in and puts a half a million to a three quarters of a million dollar business in the area, that's gonna make the surrounding businesses do better. And that's, we've gotten, you know, it's an incredible amount of people that have joined in the last 12 months. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Jane. Thank you very much. Now, those are the only folks who have signed up to speak on this matter. If anyone else here would like to speak, please come forward now. This public hearing is closed. Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 27, CD2, N180396, BDM. A public hearing in the matter of an application concerning the formation of the Hudson Square Amended Business Improvement District. We will again welcome Michael Blaze Backer. <laughs> Good morning again. Uh, Michael Blaze Backer, for the record, Deputy Commissioner of Neighborhood Development for the Department of Small Business Services. In the interest of time, I won't read all my testimony. It's submitted in writing, but to jump directly to the point, I'm here to testify in support of the expansion of the Hudson Square Business Improvement District in Manhattan. Similar to other recent bid expansions that SBS has overseen, the Hudson Square expansion effort involved numerous meetings and consultations with local stakeholders throughout the planning and outreach phases. Additionally, the steering committee organized many community planning sessions. They held informative public displays in built building lobbies and distributed various supplemental materials to inform the community. After extensive outreach and close coordination with all key stakeholders, SBS determined that the documented support among all stakeholder groups, including over 50% of the area's total assessed value signing in favor, was sufficient to submit the application to city planning. It's important to note that the SPID expansion effort has received the written support of Speaker Corey Johnson, Council Member Margaret Chin, and Manhattan Community Board too. I would also like to acknowledge that the bid expansion effort here is uh, effort is also represented here today by the president of the Hudson Square bid and members of the expansion steering committee who will also be providing testimony. Happy to take any questions. Questions for Mr. Backer. Commissioner Levin. Yeah, on this one, I did want to ask about the degree of support from commercial property owners, and maybe this sort of skews the data, but it's indicated that just 20% of commercial properties and 20% of the commercial tenants are in support of the expansion. Mm -hmm. Am I plucking a random number inappropriately? Not necessarily. We, we had a similar concern initially, but where, why that looks like somewhat different is because recently um, the district has experienced a lot of um, condoization of upper floors that are commercial condo units and not residential condo units. So um, it has been a little tricky for them doing that kind of outreach, but it, it's not uncommon when we see, so this, I, think, I think about over 50% of the commercial property owners or tax lots are actually upper floor um, condos, commercial condos. So, so we, you know, we, we, we discussed this with them and we're, worked on an outreach plan and reaching out to sort of condo boards and that kind of um, effort, but actually getting individual support from each individual condo is not something we typically push. I see. Okay. So, um, in this case, I guess a similar question to one that was asked about Throg's Neck, is the, the, those who are not represented in favor, were they in opposition or just silent? Um, in this case, I think almost entirely silent. I, if memory serves, I don't believe they had anyone signing in opposition, but I'll let um, Alan answer that Thank question. You. Vice Chair Knuckles. Yes, in the uh, proposed budget, it includes uh, $710,000 for traffic management and pedestrian safety. Mm -hmm. um, so how would the bid 
uh, interact with the city, who I presume still has primary responsibility for those functions. How do you augment uh, what the city does? Well, um, it's it's a it's an interesting service that the that the bid provides here, and really one of the you know primary reasons I think when this bid was formed was to really sort of tackle some of those challenges that were happening there um, with traffic coming out of the tunnel, going through the tunnel and how that impacted the commercial district. So it's a service that the bid already provides that uh, puts a substantial amount of their budget to it. So they'd be expanding that service. I think it's uh, something, again, Ellen could speak to, but that there's a lot of high demand for and, and a service that's really valued. So, um, I, you know, the city does not uh, I don't, I, I don't want to speak for um, necessarily for, for DOT, but I do not believe the city actually has individuals out on the street um, sort of directing um, sort of pedestrians and traffic in the exact same way in that area to the level the bid is. The, yes, exactly. Yeah, the bid, so essentially, so like other bids might have sort of um, ambassadors or security peop uh, in individuals out in the street to sort of direct uh, people, the bid actually staffs that um, considerably. There are, you know, you will see certainly at times, I think, during uh, rush hour, you know, um, PD directing traffic perhaps on Canal Street, but in this case, the bid really provides the majority of that service, and, we, and where possible, they uh, coordinate with the city. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Ortiz. Hi. Um, it was very interesting to see both of these, um, you know, on the same day, and it allows us to see the real breadth of what um, bids can do and the real differences between them. And um, so this is sort of a bigger question um, with respect to um, just the city's uh, services. I mean, SBS is so pivotal in its support of bids, and increasingly so. Um, and perhaps more so for small bids mm -hmm. than than big bids, and um, you know the sustainability of your uh, ability to support these services comes to mind. You know, as we create more and more bids, um, we want to make sure that we continue to support SBS in its efforts to support these smaller bids that we are creating because they can't really do this on their own. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have mentioned in the past that your budget is. Um, you know, some of it is dependent on tax levy dollars. Um, you know, one one question I have, if this has come up in the past, is the degree to which um, there, you know, other cities have contributions, bids contribute to, you know, a central entity or there's a fee on assessments or something that um, is sustainable and, and not sort of, open to the vagaries of the political process. Um, has the city considered um, any kind of, uh, you know, assessment of fees? And I understand that that might go to Department of Finance as opposed to you, but um, I'm just curious how we can help make sure these bids that we're forming are getting the support that they need. Right. Um, well, there's a couple ways to answer that question. I think uh, Commissioner Cirillo probably has more history in this than I do, but I would think that if, if I understand correctly that proposal, uh, if it's ever been floated, it comes more out of the OMB um, world of things and trying to raise revenues for the city. I would argue that at this point, um, certainly, you know, we, you know, we are a pretty lean team. We really, we, you know, this this administration did double the amount of um, staff we have on the bid team, so it's six individuals. You know, I would argue uh, probably on a personnel level, we probably the city's probably putting up five hundred thousand um, dollars in support for the bids, um, and I think. If you think about all the private property owners and businesses that are being are contributing $120 million being invested into our city and our neighborhoods, I don't think that's where we should be looking for revenues to claw back. I think we're actually trying to support that. And if, if there is sort of a need to, to, for additional resources, I think we have a pretty strong case to make. I think at this point, I think we're doing reasonably well. And I prefer, personally, if the bids are going to sort of begin assessing themselves in a way different, that they do that via the bid association, which is their membership association, because I think that's where some of the best practice sharing and some of the sort of professional mentorship that SBS can't quite frankly can't continue to take on perhaps at the level we'd like, but also we don't actually have the same expertise as bid directors do. So I think we'd like to see sort of the association build its capacity. So I think that's probably a better way for the bids to contribute and sort of layer on that type of service above and beyond sort of what SBS does in terms of the billing process. Got it. Thank you for that. Sure. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ellen Baer. Thank you. So tall. 
self-explanatory. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and fellow commissioners. I'm Ellen Baer, president of the Hudson Square Business Improvement District. Formed in 2009, our bid has been successfully transforming the public realm in Hudson Square, the former printing district, now a major media and technology hub, into a place for people, not just cars and trucks bound for the Holland Tunnel. One of very few bids that does not provide supplementary sanitation, our focus has been on pedestrian safety. Through our signature pedestrian safety manager program and the implementation of our $27 million public-private partnership with the city, Hudson Square is now. To date, we've planted or retrofitted 250 trees using an award-winning innovation in green infrastructure, are nearing completion of a new park on Spring Street and 6th Avenue, and are beginning construction of a protected bike lane with a widened sidewalk and new greening seating and lighting along Hudson Street from Canal to Houston. The bid in the city each contributes 50% of capital expenditures to Hudson Square is now, and there are no attendant expense budget costs for the city. The original boundaries of the bid complement what, what would eventually become the Hudson Square Special District. It's become abundantly clear that the existing bid boundaries do not match the physical, economic, or environmental boundaries of the neighborhood. Throughout the first nine years of the bid, we've consistently heard from businesses just outside our boundaries, asking for the amenities and services available to bid members. Recent rezoning, such as 550 Washington, have created an opportunity to better tie together the neighborhood and improve physical connections to surrounding neighborhoods and open spaces. In July 2016, we convened a steering committee representing the variety of commercial stakeholders in both the existing bid and potential expansion area to explore this issue of better aligning bid and neighborhood boundaries. For the past two years, the steering committee, in coordination with the New York City Department of Small Business Services, has been leading, leading an expansion process that has involved extensive community outreach. Building on the city's outreach template, we've held local visioning sessions, installed interactive displays in public areas, and designed engaging mailer materials to get extensive feedback about the needs of expansion area stakeholders. Based on that feedback, the steering committee is proposing a plan with the following key components. The proposed boundaries of the expansion area generally extend the current bid to West Street, uh, west to West Street, south to Canal Street, east to 6th Avenue and north to Clarkson, so the area is in blue. The proposed expansion area consists of a total of 392 properties and 64 commercial properties. The proposed services would be consistent with those offered by the bid, pedestrian safety management, streetscape planning and design, retail and marketing, advocacy, and maintenance of improvements we install. To cover these additional services, the steering committee has proposed an initial budget of $3.2 million with the ability to increase the budget over time to $3.9 million. Increases above the initial 3.2 million would require board approval. The bid, the, the turn to questions now. Okay, thank you. Questions from the commission. Vice Chair Knuckles. If you wanted to increase your budget, what uh, <laughs> administrative uh, mechanisms would uh, apply? If we wanted to increase our budget, you were in the you were in the process of. Oh, no, I was just going to say thank you. I'm done. <laughs> okay. I'm happy to talk about the budget, though. <laughs> okay, well, since, since we're on it, um, the 3.2, uh, what percentage increase would that represent over your, over your current budget? Our current, as you uh, appropriately pointed out, it's a $700,000 increase initially. Uh, our current budget is $2.5 million. I do want to just uh, correct one, uh, make one slight um, amendment to what you said earlier. You had indicated that the $700,000 goes to pedestrian safety services. It goes to a combination of uh, pedestrian safety services, streetscape planning and design, and retail marketing and advocacy. Okay, it's it for traffic management and, and pedestrian safety in our material, but you know best. <laughs> Other questions for Ms. Bear? Yes, Commissioner Levin. Not really just a, qu a question, but just a compliment. I think the, we're beginning to see um, in real life the streetscape improvement stuff that you've been working on for so long, and it's such an enhancement to what used to be a really nasty pedestrian situation. Um, it will never be wonderful with the Holland Tunnel right there, but you're figuring out how to make it um, a little more pedestrian friendly. I appreciate that. We've decided to embrace the presence of a regional transportation <laughs> facility. <laughs> Got to own those cars, right? <laughs> 
If I might also add in the same vein, the fact that it is turning slowly but noticeably towards a seven day a week neighborhood, not just a weekday neighborhood, is again a very positive development for the city. Commissioner Knight. Hi, Ellen. Hi. Just a question for you about um, how your traffic ambassadors interface with DOT. Sure. Um, we have a pedestrian safety management program that we contract out. Um, and there's actually city legislation which lays out what the requirements, training requirements, and so on and so forth are for this kind of a program. And so uh, DOT has reviewed those requirements and they are uh, consistent with that legislation. We interface on a daily basis with uh, DOT and PD, but the fact of the matter is that the traffic management services that the city provides really stop right at the tunnel and the queuing and other issues uh, extend far into the neighborhood and so we supplement their traffic management. Other questions? Thank you, Ms. Baer. Thank you. Our next speaker in support is Jill Salagi. Good morning, Madam Chair and fellow commissioners. My name is Jill Salai, and I am the co-chair of the Hudson Square Business Improvement District Expansion Steering Committee. I am also the general manager at Workman Publishing, the largest independent publisher in the country, with 230 employees working out of our offices at 228 Varick Street, located in the bid expansion area. Workman's been in that office for 12 years, and I've personally witnessed the dramatic transformation of the neighborhood, particularly the results of the bid's efforts, directly to our south along Varick Street. I'm proud to have co-chaired the Expansion Steering Committee over the past two years and to be presenting our proposed bid expansion on behalf of the committee. Our steering committee has represented diverse viewpoints of the neighborhood and engaged in thoughtful consideration of the neighborhood's identity and expansion area stakeholders' needs at every step of the way. Beyond my role in the steering committee, I feel personally that the bid expansion is critical for bringing about the kind of positive neighborhood change that our company and its employees need. The intersection of Varick and Clarkson Streets, situated at the northeast corner of our building, possesses a significant pedestrian safety challenge for our employees. On a typical day, during the evening commute hours, Holland Tunnel bound and local crosstown traffic become tangled in this poorly designed intersection, blocking crosswalks and pitting aggravated drivers against pedestrians trying to safely reach local transit destinations, such as the West 4th Street subway station. On more than one occasion, employees have reported to me in tears about nearly being struck by a vehicle. It is critical that steps be taken to improve the situation, and I believe that the BID's pedestrian safety management program and proposed design changes to the varick clarston intersection will go a long way toward creating a safer environment for our people. In today's competitive environment, workplace quality of life is a key component in attracting and retaining a talented workforce. And in a city like New York, workplace quality is driven very much by the quality of the surrounding streets, sidewalks, and open spaces. The bid has done a great job in humanizing the street level experience on the blocks just south of us with all of the greening and seating that has been added under the bid streetscape program. Many of our employees have passion voiced their desire for those sidewalk amenities on our block, which currently exists as a barren slab of space, only adding to the overwhelming feeling of the adjacent traffic. Additionally, improved connections to Hudson River Park are badly needed, as our neighborhood is underserved by open space, which plays an important role in the health and wellness of our employees. Hudson River Park is a first-class open space, it's located just a quarter mile from our office, but the uninviting and sometimes... <laughs> Thank you, I think we understand that point. <laughs> Thank you very much. Questions for Mrs. Salai? Yes, Commissioner Delos. You know, I, I just want to say I appreciate you connecting the experience of the employees to their satisfaction, and, and, you know, with, with their employment and, you know, what's going on in the public realm. I think all of that is very, very true, and I think we don't hear that often enough. So thank you for that. Thank you. I also want to pick up Ms. Salai. 
um, on your comment about the changes recently. I actually um, financed my living expenses while at Cooper Union by being a night typist at the printers down here. And so the differences from 1973 yes. to now are just mind blowing. <laughs> yes, it's exciting what's going on. Other questions? Then thank you very much. Thank you. We, these are the only speakers who have signed up for this item. If there are others who would like to be heard, please come forward now. The public hearing is closed. Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 28, CD4, C180273, ZSM, a public hearing in the matter of an application for the grant of a special permit concerning 116 West 23rd Street, Burlington sign. We will have a 10-minute um, team presentation by the applicant team comprised of Howard Zipser, David Nicholson, and Lisa Arantia for a total of 10 minutes. Thank you. Great. Madam Chair, uh, members of the commission, my name is Howard Zipser. I'm a partner in the law firm of Ackerman LLP at 666 Fifth Avenue. And we, be, we appear here this morning on behalf of the Burlington Coat Factory which has its flagship New York store uh, at 23rd and 6th Avenue. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, we are prepared to answer any questions. We have a short uh, digital presentation if, that, if the commission wants to see it. But uh, I really want to just uh, have special thanks to the community board number four and who adopted uh, unanimously our proposal and to the Landmarks Commission who unanimously approved uh, the approvals necessary for this 74711. And lastly, for the borough president's office that approved without condition our application. And my architect, Dave Nicholson, and my partner, Lisa Arantia, are here for any questions you may have. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Commissioner Delos. Um, thanks for being here. My, my only question really is, um, how is it that the signs were put up to begin with? What's what's the history, given where we're at today and the fact that they've been there for so long? Well, do you have an hour? <laughs> <laughs> Eight minutes and 29 seconds. <laughs> um, Gosh, 25 years ago, I... Actually, if uh, we could stop the clock because we're now in the question and answer. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 24, 25 years ago, uh, the uh, sign, the well, blade sign in particular, was unanimously approved by both the community board and by the Lamarck's Preservation Commission uh, with the help of... Uh, of uh, famous uh, preservation firm, and we uh, were left the uh, scene at that point, and the sign company, I am told, went to file a permit for the sign, and the sign was considered grossly oversized. Uh, uh, the sign restrictions at 23rd Street are very, very restrictive. We also represent Macy's at 34th Street. Their signage is probably 10 times as great. So the area is, uh, even Landmarks has said, is undersigned. So uh, when they, this was never discovered. It was erected without a permit. It was never discovered until the landlord, which is not Burlington, went to refinance the building. And in the title report found that the sign was not properly permitted. And they called us and they said, take it down. Well, the sign is essential to, to Burlington's business. This is by far and away their busiest store. And there's never been one complaint in 25 years filed with DOB or the community board or any negative and at all the hearings we've had. But basically, we went to uh, Commissioner Rebholtz, and he couldn't believe that the sign that would have been allowed was uh, a fifth the size of what was erected. I actually went to Landmarks and said, would you, 
accept this sign. They said, no, it's totally disproportionate to the size of the building. And I can go on from there, but the only thing, instead of uh, making a large district uh, regulation change to the area, which would have taken two years, we decided to go 74 7 which brilliantly also went two years. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, at all the hearings, there was uh, no speakers in opposition. Yes, Commissioner Levin. Um, so the Burlington Coat Factory is the applicant here, obviously, because the sign is essential to their business, as you've indicated, um, but does not own the building? Does not own the building. So will this, does a special permit um, continue should Burlington Coat Factory depart the building? How do, yes. how, what's the relationship between the owner and um, the applicant with respect to the, the sign, the special permit? The landlord relationship. Uh, you know, good and bad, but the uh, they have joined in this application because they realize that if our tenancy expires, they would like to have the signage available and a change in the uh, in the tenancy would require uh, going back okay. to landmarks for approval. So the special permit permit is not restricted to Burlington Coat Factory. It it applies to the entire to the well, building exactly. Good. Thank you. Commissioner Ortiz. Um, you, you raise really interesting uh, points about the, the, the history of, of what happened, I think is fascinating. And, and uh, I just want to make the point that, um, you know, Burlington is able to go through this special permit process um, and put up signs that will help its business in a way that small business owners really struggle to do. Um, and that, um, you know, uh, it's a real challenge across the city. Um, you know, the signage restrictions and the rules and regs do not reflect sort of modern retailing principles um, and what businesses can and should do to attract customers um, adequately, but no one has the time or the inclination um, to go through this process. I'm glad that they're doing this, but it's just important to flag because it's something that um, is occurring citywide and it's a, it's a very big challenge for businesses who are already struggling um, to you know, meet their, their monthly <laughs> revenue projections um, and, and just something to keep in mind. Putting on for a moment my um, commissioner of the department hat, um, we would very much welcome input that you would have of where you've encountered signage restrictions. And um, the other thing I think that would also be of interest is how communities react. Uh, I'm very struck by the fact that these signs on the building do add to the amenity of it and had such strong community support. I, signage in other communities can become a hot button issue, but we would love to be able to tap into your expertise on this. Thank you. Vice Chair Knuckles. Uh, Mr. Zipser, good morning. Good morning, sir. On the uh, question of the tenancy, I was just curious, uh, how much longer is Burlington's tenancy in the building? We have about 10 years left on our lease. You're and uh, we would love to renew, but I have no idea what market conditions would be in 10 years. If I, if I knew that, I wouldn't be a lawyer. <laughs> Other questions? <laughs> Okay, then I will thank the applicant team and note that there are no other speakers signed up on this matter. And as always, if someone would like to be heard, now would be the time to come forward. Public hearing is closed. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. Borough of Manhattan, calendar, num calendar number 28. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry, calendar numbers 29 and 30. Calendar number 29, CD5, C180263, ZSM. <clears throat> Calendar number 30, C180264, ZSM. A public hearing in the matter of applications for a zoning tax amendment and for the grant of special permits concerning 110 East 16th Street. We will have a 10 minute presentation from a seven member applicant team comprised of David Rothenberg, Wesley Wolf, Wesley O'Brien, Dan Unger, and available for questions are Tom Lewis, Sarah Scher, and Stephen Lefkowitz. Could you not be sharing? 
has recused. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll also note for the uh, record that Commissioner Efron is recused from this matter. Okay. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. I am David Rothenberg, President of Tishman Realty, a company that has been active in New York for over 100 years. We are the project's developer and the owners of the subject site on East 16th Street in Manhattan. I'm here to quickly introduce our project team, Wesley O'Brien of Fried Frank and Wes Wolf of Morris Ajmi Architects are here to present the project. We also have a few of our team members present to help answer any questions, including Dan Unger from Tishman, Stephen Lefkowitz from Fried Frank, Sarah Scher from Higgins Quaysbarth, and Tom Lewis from Morris Ajmi. I will begin with an overview of the project. In this plan, you can see the three sites that we're, we are working with to make this project possible. An existing parking garage on the south side of 16th Street is the site we own and plan to develop. Our zoning lot includes two additional sites along East 15th Street, the former Century Association Building, a New York City land, designated landmark shown on the left, and the Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute on the right. These are both commercial buildings, neither of which contain resi residential units. Further, the existing street wall on 15th Street is significantly lower than that on 16th Street. We are requesting a 74 711 landmark special permit to modify the allowed zoning envelope at the garage site to facilitate the transfer of development rights from the landmarked former Century Association building and the Lee Strasberg School on East 15th Street to our site on East 16th Street and a parking special permit to allow up to 23 accessory parking spaces. This is a street level view of the garage, which is an eyesore and an environmental nuisance for neighbors and pedestrians. It's unsafe, as evidence in this photo where the extensive curb cuts allow the sidewalk to be used for staging and backing out cars, all while pedestrians try to negotiate the sidewalk. A nearly 200 space public parking garage does not need to exist here as it contributes to traffic and con congestion on 16th Street. The site is a one minute walk from Union Square, a busy transit hub with three subway lines and furthermore, there are approximately 18 other parking garages within a five minute radius. This is what we are trying to achieve at street level. The new building would contain up to 55 residential units and up to 3,000 square feet of active ground floor retail and community facility space. You can see how much more appropriate the residential building is at this location than a garage. As we will discuss with this application, we are seeking to, one, restore the landmark former Century Association building while ensuring that it is preserved in perpetuity. Two, preserve the low street wall height and character on East 15th Street by shifting buildable floor area to our site on the higher street walled 16th Street. Three, build housing in a transit rich area, improving and enlivening the streetscape on 16th Street while eliminating the public parking garage, which will reduce traffic and make it safer for pedestrians. We estimate that the development will reduce traffic on the street by 10 to 15%. Four, ensure through the purchase of development rights, the financial well-being of one of the area's most important cultural institutions, the Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute. And five, replace a large 1960s era public parking garage with a new elegant building that is designed to relate harmoniously to the landmark and contribute to the architectural character of Union Square. And now Wes Wolf from Morris Ajmi Architects will describe the project in more detail. Good morning, commissioners. Um, thank you for having us here today. I'm Wes Wolf with Morris Edgeme Architects. Um, here's an elevation of the proposed building along 16th Street. The architecture is arranged in a classical arrangement of base, middle, and top, which is designed to reflect the context around Union Square and the immediate context of the 16th Street block. The base is clad in limestone, the center section in a buff-colored brick, and the top in a zinc-colored metal. 
There's a strong enframement, uh, metal enframement around the windows, which provides depth to the facade and relates to the um, neighboring 19th century structures. At the top, the upper floors are designed to reflect a mansard type roof of which many of the older buildings in this area. Uh, in this image, you can also appreciate the variety of scales and architectural styles that harmoniously coexist in the neighborhood. Um, what we see here is the lower portion of the building showing a vast improvement over the pedestrian level condition that exists today. The material again is limestone at the base, which is typical of the buildings on the block. The vertical proportion and rhythm of windows and the tapered profile of the pier between the windows also relate to the immediate context. The double height recessed expression of the residential entrance in the center recalls the double height elements and depth of the bases found on neighboring buildings. This slide provides a comparison of the existing and proposed ground floor plans um, with, the six, with 16th Street shown at the top. The existing curb cuts shown on the left with nearly 50 feet of curb cuts. At the right is the proposed ground floor plan with a retail community facility entrance on the left, a residential entrance in the middle, and the garage entrance on the right. The proposed curb cut is 11 feet wide, and the garage would be fully automated so that residents would drive in, exit their vehicles, push a button, and the car um, would be moved to a space at a lower level in the building. Um, as a condition of the special permit, we will be restoring the former Century Association building as shown here. The building was constructed in 1869 by the firm Gambrel and Richardson and is the only Manhattan building associated with the prominent architect H.H. Richardson. It is the oldest club building in New York City and was designated an individual landmark in 1993. As you can see on the left, there's substantial restoration scope for the landmark building, all of which has been approved by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Everything shown in yellow is being repaired and everything shown in pink is being replaced in order to more closely match the original condition. Highlights include removal of the stone's paint to expose the natural sandstone, restoration of the original wood entrance infill to match historic, installation of new wood windows to match the original windows, re re recreation of the missing metal cresting at the mansard roof based on historic documentation, and full restoration of the existing historic masonry, sheet metal, and slate mansard including at the back of the building. On the right is a rendering of the restored facade showing how the building will look after his work is complete. Um, here's a, a massing diagram looking west from Irving Place. Another benefit of the special permit is that it shifts permitted bulk away from the landmark and Lee Strasberg buildings, preserving the lower intimate street wall and more historic feel on 15th Street. Outlined at the left, you can see the existing bulk permitted adjacent to the landmark site along 15th Street, as indicated by the arrow, with the special permit will be shifting permit bulk away from the landmark building to 16th Street. This And this view of 15th Street uh, looking northwest from Irving Place, what you also notice is the consistent lower street wall that the landmark and Lee Strasberg buildings share with other buildings on the block. By way of context, we've included this series of historical photographs from Union Square, which demonstrate the varying building heights around the park and the sawtooth condition that has long been prevalent in this area. As we see today, with the addition of buildings like Zeckendorf Towers, this condition continues to define the context around Union Square. This slide shows some landmark references in the area, which were used to provide inspiration for our design noting particularly the mansard roof of the Guardian Life Building at the upper right. Uh, this slide shows the top of the proposed building in context and how it is designed to be uh, in dialogue with the other buildings in the neighborhood and around Union Square. And now Wesley O'Brien from Freed Frank will walk you through the remainder of the presentation. Hello, commissioners. <coughs> So th this is an aerial view which shows the building massing in context and more broadly how the proposed building would fit together with the existing landmarks and other buildings around Union Square. Coming down to a lower level, looking east from Union Square, you can see the profile of the building and how it fits between the heights of the taller Con Edison Tower and the Zeckendorf Tower south of 15th Street and the Guardian Life Building and other taller buildings north of 17th Street. And here is a view from 14th Street looking northeast across Union Square. 
So again, with this application, we're seeking your approval to restore the landmark former Century Association building while ensuring it's preserved in perpetuity and to, repl to replace a large public parking garage with an elegant building that is designed to re relate harmoniously to the landmark and contribute to the architectural character of Union Square. Thank you. And we have a, a letter from Dan Tishman to the commission, which I'll deliver to the secretary. Thanks so much. Questions for any members of the applicant team? Vice Chair Knuckles. Hey, thank you. you uh, Wesley, right? Yes. Uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, maintenance of the Century uh, Building in, in perpetuity. Um, precisely, what does that mean? I mean, is there an annual amount or is it on an as-needed basis? How would that... Uh, sure. So, so all of the conditions work. are recorded in a restrictive declaration against the property. There's a requirement every five years to undertake periodic inspection of the building, and that report is submitted to Landmarks. If there's any work that is necessary at that time, it is required of the building owner to undertake the work. And that exists? In perpetuity. In perpetuity. Um, this is a co-op uh, building plan, or is, it, is it a, or is it a rental? It would be likely a co-op or condo. Okay. So who bears the responsibility to provide that maintenance agreement with the uh, Century? So in the first instance, Tishman, who is the developer of this of the building, right. they will be doing the restoration scope of the landmark. Right. And then in perpetuity, the property owner, Trinity Broadcast Network, will uh, be the one to, to undertake the work. The owner of the ground, the, the of owner the of the ground is, uh, on which this is being built. The owner of the landmark. The landmark. Yes, sir. Okay. So, if we understand correctly, the um, the applicant here, the developer, will do the comprehensive renovation. After which, it becomes the responsibility of the landmark owner to maintain it. That's correct. Commissioner Delos. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, I'm wondering, just a couple questions. Sure. Um, if you could just review exactly how many square feet are proposed to be transferred. Um, what an, I don't know if you have any photos of what an as of right scenario looks like. And then um, in the discussions that you all have had um, with the community and, and going through the user process thus far, what consideration, if any, um, to providing some affordable housing or contributing towards affordable housing would be helpful. Sure. So a pertinent to our site on 16th Street is 43,000 square feet. The, the Trinity site, which is the landmark site, will be transferring another 19,500 square feet. And then the Lee Strasberg building has another 17,000 square feet, which will be transferred to our site. And then we have, a, at the end of the presentation, we have a, a waiver diagram which shows uh, the as of right height at 120 feet. If you go a little bit higher, the 160 feet is how high the, building, the building's bulkhead could be developed to. And then you see our, our building height, the bulkhead at, uh, beginning at 268 and going up to 283. I believe that the question was what the as of right development would be on this site and then also on the um, sites that are transferring air rights. Sure. So the, let's see, you can get a sense of it here. The as of right development along 15th Street is shown in red at the left. That same envelope would exist on our building, on our site as of right. And then with regard to affordable housing. So. Good morning, Commissioner. Stephen Lefkowitz, Freed Frank. I've signed in as a question answer. Uh, on affordable housing, the developer is mindful of the city's policy, obviously, of supporting, facilitating affordable housing and preserving affordable housing. Yes, of course. I'm sorry, Commissioner. Uh, Stephen Lefkowitz, Freed Frank. Uh, on affordable housing, I say we are mindful of the city's policy to support and produce and preserve affordable housing. 
We're also mindful of the city's determination that the MIH program does not apply to a project such as this. This is not a rezoning, it's not an upzoning, there's not more floor area being added. It's a matter of moving floor area within the zoning lot from one place to another. So notwithstanding the uh, lack of applicability of the MIH program, developer supports the city's policy to create and preserve affordable housing and accordingly we have reached out to elected officials and begun to discuss with them a contribution that we might make which would strengthen the city's policy and implement the city's policy. At the same time, we have begun to reach out to several not-for-profit groups that are in the business of providing or preserving affordable housing, and we'll be discussing with them over the next week or 10 days or so, uh, and thereafter, uh, their programs and their projects to see how the contribution that we intend to make can be most effectively used. Thank you. Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, one, one question on, on the parking. Um, you mentioned the application. Um, Eight to 11 spaces are as of right. Um, 12 to 15 would be additional spaces um, under the special permit. Um, are those spaces, I understand the parking is, the, is automated. Correct. Is it the same amount of square footage um, regardless of whether we, um, you know, approve the, those additional spaces? I mean, are you just, is the automation just allow us to squeeze more spaces into the same uh, yes. envelope? So because it's in a below grade area, it would not affect the square footage of the building. It's the parking spaces do not count towards floor area in the below grade area. I understand that. Yeah. That's not my question. Is, are we talking about the same amount of space going towards more cars simply because it's automated and it's more efficient? Yeah, I think the, um, uh, the automation allows for uh, some flexibility in terms of how and how many spaces you can put in. Um, it is a function of the demand for those units as well as the amount of space that we have already existing below grade. Uh, one thing to point out with, with respect to the system, it does allow for storage as well. So a car can be replaced with a pod of equal size and that's used for storage. So it, it's, a, it's a new system and it gives a lot of flexibility down the road as things change, and we all re realize what's happening in, in the world with respect to cars, uh, demand for cars may sh shift to more demand for, for storage space. So it allows that type of flexibility. So you're not, you're not creating a bigger parking area uh, as a result of this application. It, it is what it is, and you're able to squeeze more cars in because Correct. of the automation. Correct. Okay, thank you. And what the Assuming that there is this beneficial shift away from car usage, particularly in such a transit-rich neighborhood, um, would the use of the space for the storage pods count as floor area? Would that change the calculation? It would not count as floor area because it's all below. It's all below grade space. Commissioner Levin. Um, well, I had actually just wanted to uh, compliment. Mr. Lefkowitz on a particularly elegant response to the question about mandatory inclusionary housing. Um, but I, I think, you know, we've been alluding to the situation here where um, the Department of City Planning's um, position is that when a special permit unlocks additional um, development rights as is proposed here, that that does not trigger a mandatory inclusionary housing requirement. There are some of us who have disagreed with that, but we're in the minority. This is an issue that we faced up to um, with the Adorama application um, on 23rd Street. And I think the outreach that Mr. Lefkowitz was referring to um, about the potential for a contribution to affordable housing efforts elsewhere reflects what happened in the Adorama case where at the city council, um, the Adorama folks um, did make a commitment to affordable housing independent of what happened here at the commission. So I continue to um, support the application of some kind of affordable housing commitment on applications like this. I don't imagine that we're going to change the precedent that we set at the commission level with Adorama, but um, I would be very happy to see um, down the road after it leaves us um, a commitment by the developer to support affordable housing. I think it's particularly important with uh, projects that 
you know, have the um, demographic potential that this one does, that they also contribute to um, uh, socioeconomic diversity in neighborhoods like this. Um, so thank you for uh, being so forthcoming about your willingness to have that conversation later. Other questions? Then thanks to the applicant team. Thank you. I would uh, also say thank, thank you for making it so easy to approve a building that's twice as tall as it should be. <laughs> <laughs> An example of a picture being worth a thousand words or a thousand line of, lines of zoning text. Um, we will now turn to speakers in support, beginning with Elon Stern. Good morning. My name, well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Elon Stern. I'm the Vice President of Operations for the New York Building Congress, and I am pleased to express our strong support for Tishman Realty and their project on 110 East 16th. The New York Building Congress has, for almost 100 years, advocated for investment in infrastructure, pursued job creation, and promoted outstanding projects like this one in the New York City area. Our association is made up of over 550 organizations comprising more than 250,000 professionals. Through our members, events, and various committees, we seek to address the critical issues of the construction industry and consistently promote the economic and social advancement of our city and its constituents. The project site is an ideal location for higher density development given its proximity to public transit, premier parks, and retail. As our city continues to experience significant growth, we need to be mindful of where and how we accommodate the influx of residents and businesses. The project promotes walkability and significantly reduces reliance on automobiles, therefore making it a model of development that should exist near transit hubs across the city. Further, Tishman has worked with the architect Morris Ajme to design an attractive, contextually appropriate building for the neighborhood. Not only will it blend with the historic features nearby, it will preserve the integrity of Union Square by responding to the height and context of the surrounding buildings. Tishman has put an enormous amount of thought into this project to ensure it is truly an added benefit to the community and has actively engaged with community stakeholders to be as sensitive as possible to all concerns. This opinion was echoed by the Landmarks Preservation Commission in their January approval. Finally, the project brings a long-term commitment to the maintenance and health of Lee Strasberg Theater at 111 15th, giving back to the preservation of New York City's rich architectural history. In closing, the New York Building Congress strongly urges the City Planning Commission for approval of the permit application. Questions for Mr. Stern? Thank you. Our next speaker in support is Angela Pinsky. Hi, good morning, Commission. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for allowing me to testify. The Association for a Better New York is a 47-year-old civic organization that promotes the effective cooperation of public and private sectors to improve the quality of life for all New Yorkers. On behalf of ABNY, thank you for the opportunity exp to express our support for the proposed redevelopment of 110 East 16th Street, as proposed by Tishman Realty. The project proposes a mixed-use development, including retail and a community community facility, 40 to 55 residential units, and a restoration of a four-story landmark, 111 East 15th Street. In addition to the transit-oriented development nature of the project that fits within the city's overall plans for smart growth, we believe the proposal will provide significant improvements to the immediate vicinity. By replacing a nine-story nine parking garage with a mixed-use development, the project would provide continuous street-level use and would add activity to what is currently a blank wall of use. Additionally, the removal of the parking garage on East 16th Street would reduce the subsequent automobile traffic heading toward Irving Place, providing particular relief to the students foot traffic around the nearby high schools. To help with the for 
to help with the affordability crisis we are facing in the city, we need to continue to create capacity for housing development in all areas of our city for all income levels. However, given the congestion and strains on our infrastructure we see today, in addition to the anticipated demand we expect by, over, by the over 9 million New Yorkers by 2040, it becomes imperative to focus and promote reasonable and contextual growth in areas that are well served by public transit and are in close proximity to commercial cores resource like the Union Square area. The 110 East 16th Street proposal is sensitive to the surrounding buildings and is architecturally coherent with existing buildings in the Union Square area. Additionally, the preservation of the significant, architecturally significant 111 East 15th Street helps to preserve the historic nature of this area. We urge the City Planning Commission to approve this mixed-use proposal. Thank you again. Questions for Ms. Pinsky? Thank you. Our next speaker in support is Sebastian Tertullian. And I'll note that he will be followed by Victoria Keene. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Sebastian Tertullian. I work on new development at 32BJ. 32BJ is the largest property service union representing 85,000 service workers across New York City and 160,000 nationwide, especially the approximately 20,000 members who work and live in the Midtown area where this project will be built. 32BJ members maintain, clean, and support and provide security services in schools, commercial, and residential buildings all across the five boroughs. Our union supports responsible developers that facilitate economic justice for our members. When completed, we anticipate that the building at 110 East 16th Street will be staffed by approximately six building service workers. And we are happy to report that East 16th Street owner LLC, an affiliate of Tishman Realty, has committed to creating high quality permanent building service jobs <clears throat> that will support working families. These jobs will provide family sustaining wages and benefits that will give workers at the site the means to take care of their families and continue to call New York City home. Finally, 32BJ has a long-standing relationship with Tishman at many other buildings in New York City and in New Jersey. For these reasons, I am here to urge the Planning Commission to support this project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tertullian. Questions? Thanks. Our next speaker in support is Victoria Keene who will be followed by Sherida Paulson. Good morning and hello. My name is Victoria Crane. Oh, Crane. I am the president of the Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute, located at 115 East 15th Street. I have been with the Institute for the past 36 years. Anna Strasberg, the co-founder and artistic director, unfortunately couldn't be here today, but sends her regards and strong support to the project proposed by Tishman at 110 East 16th Street. The Lee Strasberg Theatre and Film Institute has a long history on East 15th Street and is part of the fabric of the, this community. In this coming school year of 2018-2019, we will be celebrating our 50th anniversary at this location. In 2001, the centennial of Lee's birth, the block was named Lee Strasberg Way. Lee loved this city and was a New York success story. He grew up not far from where we are presently located, and he educated himself by reading books from the public libraries and bookstores, including The Strand. He discovered his love of the theater while acting at plays at the Christie Street Settlement. From this humble start, he went on to become one of the major influences on the development of the techniques of modern acting and directing, and his name is recognized throughout the world. Over the years, to follow Lee's mission, we have offered many scholarships to young people in our community 
to give them an opportunity to develop their talents and pursue their dreams and arts. For example, we have had a relationship with the New York Housing Authority for the past, for over 30 years, offering residents scholarships to both our adult and young youth programs. This year, we were able to we were able to reach out to the New York Times Neediest Case Fund to offer scholarship to a young New York actor experiencing difficult times. Every year in our theater, we present many plays, new ones, well-known classics and musicals, at low prices to theater lovers in our community. Our productions are free to the elderly who live in the neighborhood and who frequently attend them. The sale of our air rights would enable us to make much needed improvements in our building, classrooms, and theaters, and to update our facilities, lighting, and technical equipment so that we can continue to offer the highest level of training in the acting in theater, film, television, and digital media, and meet the needs of students for years to come. It would also allow us to expand our scholarship program to offer opportunities more talented and deserving young people in our community. We homesteaded that neighborhood. Thank you, Ms. Crane. And I should start by saying happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And questions from the commission. Commissioner Delos. Um, Thank you for being here. I've, I've, I've been in the building and it's, it's lovely. I'm sorry, I don't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I says thank you for being here, and I said I've been in the property, and it's it's a lovely property. Thank you so much for giving you uh, giving us time. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, Ms. Uh, Crane, uh, we actually do have a question for you. If you would mind. Sorry. Um, I was uh, the question I have for you. Um, you just mentioned that the transfer of the air rights would also enable you to expand your scholarship opportunities. I'm wondering how that is, um, given that my understanding is that the transfer of development rights would really enable the restoration of the property itself. Well, we we will allocate some monies to the uh, to the restoration of the you know our building and and you know the wear and tear of the building, but we will also allocate monies towards the the scholarship programs. I might clarify that the theater building is not the landmark building. This is not this is not the landmark building. Thank okay. you, Ms. Crane. Thank you. Our next speaker in support is Sherida Paulson, and she'll be followed by Jack Davies. Unfortunately, Sherrod is stuck on the subway, so we will be submitting her testimony in writing. Great, thank you. Then Mr. Davies. And following Mr. Davies will be Jennifer Falk. Good afternoon. Thank you for convening this hearing for the chance to testify. My name is Jack Davies. I'm the Policy and Campaigns Manager for Transportation Alternatives for 45 years. Transalt has advocated on behalf of New Yorkers for safer and more livable streets with more than 150,000 people in our network and over 1,000 activists throughout all five boroughs. We fight to promote biking, walking, and public transportation as alternatives to the car. I am here today to voice our support for the special permits requested at 110 East 16th Street, New York needs growth that encourages public transit use, walking and bicycling instead of driving, and we feel especially strongly that the requested permits in this case are the responsible approach to development in Manhattan. 110 East 6... East 16th Street will improve the streetscape and reduce the length of the existing curb cut. The development is estimated to reduce traffic on the street by 10 to 15 percent on a block that is often populated by children given its proximity to nearby schools. It is situated near Union Square, one of the largest transit hubs and most public transit rich sites in the city. And with the L train shut down rapidly approaching and congestion along 14th Street and the area immediately surrounding 14th Street expected to skyrocket high density development in the this neighborhood continue, contributes to walkability and significantly reduces reliance on automobiles. 110 East 16th Street will also eliminate a 196 car parking garage. Research has shown that when the supply of parking is high, the demand to drive also increases even when that driving isn't critical. This in turn leads to increased traffic congestion, slower bus speeds, increased air pollution, and compromised pedestrian and bicycle safety all across the city. As traffic congestion, safety, and pollution reach crisis 
levels in New York, we should not be encouraging development that needlessly keeps more cars on the road. Granting the requested permits would set an important precedent, not only in development best practices, but in prioritizing people over motor vehicles. As the population of New York continues to grow and safe, sustainable, and equitable space becomes more and more scarce, transit-oriented development must be a priority here and in high-density and transit-sufficient neighborhoods across the city. Please join Transportation Alternatives in supporting this project. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Davies? Thanks. Our next speaker is Jennifer Falk, who will be followed by Paimon Lodi. <laughs> Oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jennifer Falk, and I serve as the executive director of the Union Square Partnership. We are a community-based nonprofit organization that has served the neighborhood since 1976. And I am here today to express our full support for the proposed redevelopment of 110 East 16th Street into a mixed-use building. As many of you know, Union Square is a robust, mixed-use, 24-7 residential and commercial neighborhood. The proposed development site will be surrounded by several existing uh, large residential and commercial buildings, as you've heard, um, including Zeckendorf Towers to the south, the W New York Union Square to the north, the Con Edison Building to the east, as well as a number of buildings along 14th Street, including NYU's Palladium and the soon-to-be, we hope, uh, Union Square Tech Training Center. We strongly believe that Tishman has pr proposed, presented a thoughtful, high-density design for the project, one that is in context with the existing and planned built environment. The change in use for the site from multi-story parking garage to a primarily mixed-use residential building will contribute, as you've heard, to walkability and likely have traffic calming measures that will benefit this stretch of the district. The project will also bring new public amenities to the eastern side of our district, including square footage for ground floor retail and an investment in the streetscape, including new trees and street plantings. Based on shadow studies, we are pleased that the building's design will have minimal impacts on Union Square Park, which is very important to our organization. And we are encouraged by Tishman's commitment to the uh, district's landmarks and the contributions they will be making to improve the facade at 111 East 15th Street. Lastly, I just just like to say that Tishman has been an incredibly productive neighborhood partner. They have been responsive to our questions and concerns. They have made a number of changes based on those concerns, and we've been actively working with them over the last few years, and we are pleased by their commitment, though not required, um, to support affordable housing projects. So I thank the members of this commission for your thoughtful com um, consideration of this application, and we encourage you to support it. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Falk? Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Paimon Lodi, who will be followed by Jeffrey Brault. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Paimon Lodi. I'm here on behalf of the Real Estate Board of New York. Um, Rebney supports Tishman's plan to develop the site at 110 East 16th Street and believes that, the, that their application merits approval from the commission. The transfer of air rights from 111 East 15th Street will allow for the continued maintenance and restoration of the historic landmark, the Century Association Building, and through the purchase of development rights, ensure the financial well-being of the Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute. Tishman is working with Morris, Morris Ajami, an architect renowned for his ability to create historically contextual buildings. His design for the building will honor the period style emblematic of the Union Square area, respectfully blending in with the neighborhood charm. Finally, the location of a residential building on this site makes sense given its proximity to the well-served Union Square Transit Station. The development is estimated to reduce traffic on the street by 10 to 15 percent and will improve the streetscape by activating the space that is currently a parking garage, reducing the existing curb cut, and providing trees on the sidewalk. The plans for 110 East 16th Street have been, have been deemed contextual and appropriate by the Landmarks Preservation Commission, and we ask the City Planning Commission to approve this application as well. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Lodi? Thank you. Um, our next speaker in support is Jeffrey Brault. Good morning. Uh, Jeffrey Brault, Manhattan Chamber of Commerce, speaking on behalf of our CEO, Jessica Walker. Uh, I'll keep this relatively short and echoing many of the previous speakers. The Chamber is excited to support the development of the beautiful new building at 110 East 16th Street, which will add to the city's iconic skyline while keeping with the historic context of the neighborhood. Benefits to the area are immense. 
restoration of an historic building at 111 East 15th Street, which will contribute to the historic quality of the neighborhood, updating the building for unobstructed access and ensuring that TBN, a neighborhood institution, can remain in place for the long term. The project also includes small-scale retail that will add a mid-block amenity for residents of the neighborhood. The project will improve the streetscape, reducing the length of the ex existing curb cut and providing trees on the sidewalk. And in the context of the upcoming L train closure and traffic congestion that is expected to result, high density development like this will be a mitigating factor, <laughs> excuse me, by contributing to the walkability uh, and reducing reliance on cars in the neighborhood. The proposed project at 110 E 16th Street is a model for the type of development that should exist throughout the city. And on, the, on behalf of the Manhattan Chamber and our members, I implore the commission to support this vital project. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Brault? Those are the only speakers who have registered to speak on this item, but if there are others who are present who would like to speak, please come forward now. The public hearing is closed. Borough of Queens, calendar number 31, CD7, C180285, PCQ, a public hearing in the matter of an application for site selection and acquisition of property concerning the NYPD 112th Street parking lease. The first speaker will be Donald Bowler, and available for questioning are Ralph Cordano and Dale Lazarson. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I am uh, Deputy Inspector Donald Bowler from the New York City Police Department. Today we're here, we are um, requesting approval for the continued use of our parking lots around our facility in College Point, Queens. The first slide just shows a visual. Um, basically right in the middle, you see our location at 14-04 111th Street. And one of the highlighted locations is the parking lot at 110th Street. That parking lot came with the building. Uh, the second parking lot at 112th Street was added two years later. So a little history of the location. We moved into the facility at 14 4 111th Street in uh, 2008. And like I said earlier, basically it came with 148 parking spots. Unfortunately, we have 202 department vehicles alone without any personal vehicles. So obviously the uh, park was insufficient. So um, there's insufficient, obviously, like I said, for the, for the department vehicles and the personal vehicles. And in addition, I just like to say, I was there in 2009 um, and I firsthand saw the strain on the neighborhood. It, co it caused, uh, you know, problems with the community just for their own parking. It caused problems with our workers. Um, the department realized this is a, an issue and they tried to resolve the issue as quick as they can. So um, in 2010, they acquired this lot on 112th Street. This lot has 162 additional parking spots. So it gives a total of um, 310 parking spots, which is adequate parking because for the main, for mostly we usually have about around 360 to 370 total personnel working at the facility, but they're never all there at the same time. Um, people work weekends, people have different days off, and people work different hours. So basically, um, like I said, I'm just basically here for questions to try to be straightforward about the condition. Um, uh, I got involved in this process because, uh, like I said, I uh, came to the building in 2009 before the uh, second lot was acquired. I saw firsthand the problems. I uh, moved on to a different unit um, in 2012, and I came back in 2016, and I, I'm a commanding officer of the narcotics unit in that building. And the tremendous, uh, the change in events with the community and the parking conditions, we pull out of the parking lot, there are open parking spots on the street currently that would never existed before this, this lot was approved in 2010. So, um, like I said, <laughs> the neighborhood relationship uh, could not be better. Whereas in uh, 2009 when I was there, um, whether you work in Queens or you work anywhere in the city, parking is a problem and it, it has improved dramatically. So if anyone has any questions. Yes, Vice Chair Nuff Knuckles. Uh, well, first, thank you for your service. Thank uh, you to the citizenry. Um, I think you've answered this question in your remarks, but I just wanted to uh, 
confirm, would this accommodation um, completely eliminate the need for on-street parking by your personnel going forward? I wouldn't say it completely eliminates. It, it is very close to eliminating it. Um, Truthfully, um, there are some spots right right in front of the location. So oftentimes officers will pull up a vehicle, come in and out, but there's adequate parking for the residents. No doubt about it. Commissioner Levin. Um, both of the, the community board and the borough president um, approved this on the condition that uh, we get promises that the staffing at this location won't increase. Listening to you speak, I think maybe their condition should have been that you stay at that location. <laughs> <laughs> you seem to be. I would love to, to stay there. To be um, um, but what assurances can you give us that the um, conditions of the community board and the borough president will be fulfilled and that staffing will stay as is? Unfortunately, that's you know, truly way above my pay grade. <laughs> I can't. I cannot guarantee. Um, which units will be there. I'd love to say, truthfully, I'd love to say I'd be there for another 10 years. Um, I could say this things are working very well at the location uh, compared to what it was. Um, I know they have a, at least at the building for another 10 years at least, so I, I don't foresee any changes. Okay, so there are no, no staffing increases uh, in the works? No, and I, I address the community board, just uh, like other uh, agencies, um, we have highs and lows just to do to attrition. Um, so, like I said, maxed out, we've been at like 375. Now we could easily be down to 350 based on attrition and backfill and whatever that shows up, but I can't make any guarantees moving forward. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Yeah. And um, Mr. Baller is the only person signed up to speak on this matter, but as always, if anyone in the room wants to be heard, now would be the time. The public hearing is closed. Thank you. Borough of Queens, calendar number 32, CD5, C180138, ZMQ. A public hearing in the matter of ap an application for a zoning map amendment concerning Lefferts Boulevard rezoning. Our first speaker in support is Richard LaBell. Um, good morning, Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel PC for the applicant. So I'm joined today by Fayan Baton from my office as well as Tony Prossos, the project uh, owner, and the application is for the Lefferts Boulevard rezoning. This is a relatively small rezoning action um, which uh, affects approximately two lots um, in the Ozone Park section of Queens. Um, so the property was originally zoned C42 and as part of the ozone park rezoning uh, a few years ago was actually the uh, change to a split district R6A C23 and you can see the R6A along um, Liberty in that area and the remainder of the property was uh, which was a uh, remainder of this lot and the and for about 36 feet, the, the property was changed to R4A, or I'm sorry, R41. So really, what was the effect of that and what, what was the cause of that? Really, this ended up being an issue of measurement. So prior to this time, the district boundary was measured from Liberty 200 feet south, and so the property was included in a commercial district. Whereas when the rezoning took place, the rezoning essentially was measured from 107th Avenue. Uh, and, and so 107th Avenue, and you can kind of see this from the uh, the zoning change map, 107th Avenue is a fix, offers a fixed uh, district so that the uh, 540 feet up Lefferts Boulevard became the zoning district boundary. What did that do? It basically split the uh, applicant's zone, uh, zoning lot into a three to four foot portion of a commercial overlay and then a 16 foot approximate portion uh, of an, an R41 district. The actual land use um, in the area really reflects um, commercial in kind of a sawtooth pattern, but you can see here, just from looking at the proposed rezoning surrounded by the dotted lines, that the commercial district already exists both uh, to the rear of the property, so you can see along the rear there's already uh, two lots that are uh, zoned commercial, including behind our property, as well as across the street, and commercial uses generally tend to 
uh, to uh, exist to a depth of, in some cases, 200 feet or greater down the side streets from Liberty. So the, um, you can see the land use map, uh, and if you look in the highlighted area from the, uh, again, the uh, dotted portion, commercial uses exist to the rear of our property, as well as to the, uh, across Lefferts Boulevard. Um, in addition, there is a, a use, a commercial use to the south of our property, which would be included within the rezoning area. I would just add in my brief seconds that the, both the community board and the borough president approve this rezoning and happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Lobel. Questions? Commissioner De La Uz. Hi, Mr. Lobel. Good Hi. to see you. Thanks Sorry. for being here. Just a quick question. Is the, is the intention only to redevelop at 100% commercial use or to have a mixed residential and commercial it's, use? It's to redevelop 100% commercial use. It would be a one-story commercial store. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? Commissioner Levin. Yes, Mr. Lobel, the, um, both the community board and the borough president had a concern about the parcel that's not your client's property, and that is, I guess it's lot 12 that has a shared driveway. Um, what's the future of that shared driveway with this rezoning application? Um, that shared driveway is actually, uh, is actually memorialized in the deeds both for lot 12 and lot 13. Um, so essentially, as a legal matter, they wouldn't be able to develop within that portion and the shared driveway would remain. <clears throat> okay, so, so this would, I guess... Lot 11, I'm sorry, lot 11 and lot 12. Legalize the commercial use that's now happening on lot 11, but make future development um, unlikely. Correct. It would. It was essentially they would have to maintain that that uh, area between the two buildings. Uh, currently, the ground floor space on lot on lot twelve is occupied by a um, by a, a tax office. Lot, lot eleven. A lot, lot eleven. Lot I apologize. 11. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Thank you, Mr. Thanks, so, thanks so much for your time. Fayan Baton. No. Oh, uh, the remainder of the project team was available for questions, but okay. apparently there are not. Uh, questions for uh, Mr. Prasos, the pop property owner. He is here, right, for questions? Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are they, there you are. And I think Vice Chair Knuckles was about to say, if, ask if there was anyone else here present who would like to be heard on the matter. And if not, the public hearing is closed. Borough of Queens, calendar numbers 33 through 37. Calendar number 33, CD2, C1803H6, PPQ. Calendar number 34, C1803H4ZSQ. Calendar number 35, C180385PPQ. Calendar number 36, C180382ZSQ. Calendar number 37, C180383ZSQ. In the matter of applications, a public hearing in the matter of applications for disposition of city owned property and for the grant of special permits concerning 26 32 and 27 01 Jackson Avenue. And I'll note for the commission that we are holding a joint public hearing on the two applications since the issues are so similar. We will have a 10 minute presentation from the applicant team comprised of Paris Strotter, Jay Siegel, Aaron Shinian, Louise Russo is available for questions, Chris Grant is available for questions, Lisa Lau is available for questions, as is Mary Deitz. Uh, greetings, commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to present today. My name is Paris Strotter, and I'm with the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Uh, I'm representing, uh, or another was known as HBD, I'm representing HBD today. Um, and I'm here to present this project, <clears throat> which we call the LIC Ramps. Uh, it involves uh, two properties. How do I advance the presentation? I'm sorry. Right here. Great. Sorry about that. Um, uh, two properties located in the Court Square neighborhood of Long Island City. Uh, here's a project area map. 
Uh, so there's two sites that are the development sites, and both are receiving uh, or proposed to receive city-owned development rights from adjacent city-owned parcels located under the Queensboro Bridge approach ramps. So <clears throat> the first site here on the north side of Jackson Avenue, and both sites are, are at the corner of Jackson and 43rd Avenue. Uh, this is the northern site, uh, site one we'll call it, and then on the across, directly across the street from that site on the southern side, also directly adjacent to the Queensboro Bridge approach ramps is uh, site two or the southern development site. Again, receiving, proposed to receive development rights from an adjacent city owned parcel under the ramps. So you can see the parcels here um, on, the, uh, on the plan. So as I said, 2701 is the north. We're proposing to sell 66,368 square feet of development rights from uh, two city owned parcels located under the ramps. Uh, and then on the other side of the street, 2632 Jackson Avenue, we're proposing to sell 296,315 square feet uh, of a total of 400,000 available from an adjacent city owned parcel uh, located under the ramp. So uh, in total, we're, sell, we're proposing to sell 362,683 square feet of development rights in order to get approximately 151,000 square feet of affordable floor area. And what that translates to is roughly 42% of the rights to be transferred will be permanently affordable. And the, the permanent affordability will mirror uh, MIH, the Mandatory Inclusionary Housing Program, option three, the workforce option. And I'll explain more later, but uh, essentially the, the, the subsidy here, there's no subsidies for the affordable and the purchase price of the development rights is the affordability to be provided. So I think that's better to explain here, and I'll explain that in a second after we talk about the, the bands. There's, four, there's a maximum of four bands allowed in the MIH program. Uh, here we're proposing, under the workforce option, to provide 22 units at 60% AMI rents, 18 units at 90% AMI rents, 110 units at 14, I'm sorry, 14 units at 110 AMI rents, and uh, 96 units at 130% AMI rents. And this is compliant with option three, which is averages it to 30% uh, of the floor area at an average of 115% AMI rents, or well, incomes, but these, these, these will be compliant with rents. Um, and the idea behind the project here and the affordability we came up with was that we have these rights, they have no other use because we can't build on the properties under the ramps. So we put out an RFP in 2014 to uh, adjacent property owners and really only got one viable proposal uh, to say how, how can we maximize the amount of affordability we can get for these development rights uh, without putting subsidy. Um, and what we came up with was a middle income affordability option that really speaks to the needs of Long Island City given how high rents are in the neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna, uh, I know there's a lot of questions that have come up already, um, and I'm, I'm here to answer them, but I'm gonna, we're gonna continue the, for, the, for the presentation for now, and then I'll be happy to explain more about kind of how the city came up and negotiated the deal. My name is Jay Siegel, and I'm here to talk for a moment about the actions. The, one of the obvious actions is the disposition action, so we can purchase the 362,000 square feet of development rights. In addition to that, and I'm going to move this thing along. There you go. In addition, in addition to that, we get an easement of light and air over the city property, so that the windows that face over the city property could be legal windows. There are special permits for the modification of street walls because of the way the Long Island City regulations are constructed. The city would have to build buildings on its property um, in order to comply with the street wall regulations, which the city doesn't want to do. Um, and we would have to set back from the portion of our property that faces the ramp, which would be extremely awkward. Um, in addition, we're setting back eight feet from our property line on the north side 
at the request of, um, of DOT. You see on the north, we're leaving um, eight feet. There's a gap between the city's property and our property, and that's so DOT can move its equipment in to repair the ramp. Um, the only other action we're seeking is a special permit for a public parking garage on the north side, um, and that's because the, we can't have a garage in both buildings since you can't have a curb cut on Jackson Avenue, and we want the people from both of our buildings to be able to park in the garage, so we have to call it a public parking garage. Of course, the garage would be open to anybody um, in the public, but we think overwhelmingly it would be used by the people who are living uh, the 480 units that'll be in both buildings will probably populate the 91 space garage. Those are the actions to effectuate the plan, and I'm also here to answer questions, but the third speaker will, will take up some of our remaining time. You want to show him the building? Which you're so proud of. Thank you, Jay. I'll try not to take up too much of the remaining time. I'm just going to speak briefly about the development team and the history of the project. Uh, Lions Group is a family-owned ground-up development company. Uh, we have been developing in Long Island City since 2004. Uh, since then, we have built about a dozen buildings in the area, uh, the large majority of which have been condominiums, as our typical business model uh, has been to build 15 to 20-story condominium buildings, uh, sell them and move on. Uh, we purchased the two Jackson Avenue properties with the intent of doing uh, the same thing. Um, we, in fact, did get a set of plans approved and pull a building permit and we're ready to move forward. Uh, we did engage in conversations with the city after the RFP was issued, although we could not find a way of making uh, an economically viable project that included so much affordable housing, uh, largely because we had not built affordable housing before. Uh, we were very fortunate to partner with Fetner Properties, um, and our partner, Hal Fetner, is unfortunately uh, out of town, but he would be here otherwise. Uh, they were an excellent partner for us because of their experience building large-scale developments and affordable housing. Um, with them, uh, working with HPD, we were finally able to come up with uh, a program that works, which is the program that is before you today. Uh, I am also available for questions. Thank you. The buildings that you could see, uh, this is the north building, uh, it would be 27 stories. The south building would be 49 stories. Um, and they would have, uh, essentially, the north building would have a, a little retail on the ground floor, and the next, uh, the rest of the ground floor and the two floors above would be for the 91 parking spaces I described before. This building would have two stories of retail, and the rest would be residential. I think, and this is a, 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 an initial design of what our buildings would look like. I think we finished in time, and we're here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Questions for the applicant team? Commissioner Delahouz. I see our friends from HPD coming closer to the mic again. I appreciate that. <laughs> you anticipated where my questions were going to go. Do you mind going back to your slide? That that. Um, so Which one would you like? This one. Yeah, that one. And and just walk me through again um, uh, the percent for each property, the percent that's being tran that that is being sold, and what that represents in terms of the percent of affordability. Um, and then uh, I guess I want to get a greater understanding of why option three. I mean, is it is it just about the project finance, like, you know, um, numbers and budget um, rather than community need? Um, and uh, I, I also want to have a sense of, um, of well, let's just stop there for now and I'll come back with more questions. Sure. Um, so the total transfer across both buildings is the 362,683. Uh, of that, 151,000 of the total resulting building, or both buildings, excuse me, uh, 151,000 is affordable. So that results in 42% of the transferred uh, rights, but it's only th roughly 30% of the, uh, the total building, which is compliant with MIH. And, and in terms of how, <clears throat> why option three as opposed to other options, so uh, we were very direct in that we wanted the only subsidy to be really the, 
the purchase price. So essentially, instead of getting cash for the development rights, we're getting affordable housing. So starting with what the cost of affordable housing, would, well, we start with the cost of the development rights and subtract out what the cost of building, providing, and operating in perpetuity the affordable housing is. And from that, we came up with, um, with, with basically a price that fits into MIH option three. I mean, really, we didn't have to exactly land there, but we wanted, we were very uh, deliberate, and then we wanted to land on one of the MIH options because we didn't want to kind of customize this. It's better if we can kind of fit within an existing program. The numbers, and we negotiated for a couple years about this back and forth with the development team. The numbers just didn't work without any subsidy. So there's no tax credits in here, there's no bonds, and obviously no city capital. Um, and the numbers just don't work at any of the other MIH options. Um, except for three. Uh, what made us a little, you know, so essentially it is a financial uh, argument, but in Long Island City particularly because incomes are so high and rents are so high in this neighborhood as it's changed over the last 15, 20 years, uh, we felt a little more comfortable with landing there because there is a need for, uh, for those units at even the higher income levels in this neighborhood. Please continue. I, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I would just say that, you know, at least 30% of the population in the community board is below 60% of AMI, so there's a pretty significant need that exists below as well. Um, not, you know, not to say there hasn't been a dramatic change over the last 15 years. So I guess, uh, is it fair for me to take from what you said that, you know, with, with the city's desire to try to fit within an existing MIH option and option three and, and you know, kind of like reverse engineering into option three the way that the city did in this case, is there is there money being left on the table um, that, and if so, where is it going? Um, and uh, And... Could it go to a pool of funds for affordable housing in the same community board, which the, the existing MIH legislation allows for that as well, that could help reach some of the deeper affordability that is so also needed in this case? So yes, yeah, so a good question. Um, the consideration is in two parts, so I'll explain the, the second part in, in a second. But in terms of just is there money left on the table, no. We really believe we've gotten the best deal here. Uh, we pushed the developers hard. You know, what's made it easier in the negotiations, even though it has been a couple of years, is, is Fetner at least has experience working with HPD and building affordable housing. Um, you know, so that made the negotiations have a little more traction. But we really, really do believe the city is getting the best deal based on um, the cost of providing these units without subsidy. That said, you know, there's a condo portion here. Um, so basically, roughly a third of both buildings have a condo component. And we were very clear that, you know, there's an upside on the condo that might be substantial. And we didn't necessarily want to, we, we were clear that in negotiating this deal, we couldn't, we could only push developers so far on uncertain, uncertainty. And of course, condo prices are very uncertain. Um, but we, the second part of the consideration, so the consideration is both the affordable housing without subsidy, and we're sharing in uh, the upside on the condo. So essentially, there's a cash payment to the city, which will be used for an affordable housing fund for just this community board. Um, and that, that gets triggered based on what the condos sell at. So, um, you know, there's kind of, and, and we're happy to provide more information about this, but, you know, we did some speculation on what the condos might sell for, but there's a range. And basically, based on whatever that per square foot sales price is of the condos, the city shares in that revenue. Commissioner Manin. Were there any appraisals performed to determine whether or not the values that you were getting were, were values that were in line with what property values are? Yeah, we did a lot of appraisals, uh, both to value the development rights and to look at condo comps in the neighborhood. And so the prices that you're getting are in line with those? Yes, so mar the market, I mean, we're basically we're using market values and um, to value both the development rights as well as the condos. Thank you. Commissioner Efron. Um, was there any consideration to having uh, low income ownerships through some sort of a condominium opportunity since we haven't seen a lot of affordable condominiums? I have another question after this. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, there's been challenges with that and other HPD deals. Um, 
you know, to be honest, I, I can't say that it's been a, a lot of our conversation. I think that, you know, we'd have to think about that more, but it, usually the, the idea of, and I mean, the development team can come in here too if they have some ideas about this, but we thought it was easier to do the MIH on the, the rental part of the building, and that's typically how we do this across the city. Um, how, you know, so generally HPD, in terms of how we do ownership, we run into an issue with low income ownership. Um, it's certainly affordable home ownership um, is something above 80% 80% of AMI and higher is something that we do across the city with home ownership, but um, low inc incomes lower than 80% of AMI get challenging. Um, so, that, so typically we just try to constrain the affordable component of an MIH project within the rental. It also works better just from the kind of transactions of um, both financing that, but also operating it in perpetuity to keep those uh, parts of the building separate where you have mixed tenure within the building. Well, I think this is a special set of circumstances considering it's city-owned FAR. Um, and something I would like to know more about is how the uh, future income from the condominiums were determined. And I think there should be a working assumption that the highest square footage here is really the city square footage as opposed to um, some other consideration where it's spread out across the building if, in fact, the affordability under MIH isn't spread all the way through the building since the condo is um, limiting where the MIH can go, if you see what I mean. <laughs> so I would really very much like to see how the calculation was determined on uh, the future earnings to the city and ultimately to the public on the condo portion. I, I'm not sure we've seen a condo, a, an MIH, where we where there was no consideration for a condominium since the commission I, has met, have we? I don't think we've seen a structure like this, um, but I will note that the, well, and we'll cover this at the review session, that the remit of the commission is on the land use considerations, not on the financial structuring, although obviously as commissioners, as public servants, as citizens, we're quite interested, and I appreciate the information that is being provided. And, and the only thing I would say is that I, I think during the uh, MIH discussion, there was some question about what would happen with condominiums versus rentals, so um, as the first one essentially to come before us. I think it is a bit of a land use issue in that um, uh, a question of whether there should be affordability accounted for within condos as well as within the rentals. Again, we'll address that in the post hearing right. follow up because the mix of land use versus the economics Fair of the enough. transaction, there are other public processes um, that go yeah. more directly to the economics. Right. I, I mean, I don't think we should be opining about the value. I'm just curious about how it was derived. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Levin. Well, then I do have a land use question about this, uh, but it really relates, I imagine, to the um, design of the deal, as you've just laid it out, and that is uh, how it was decided um, what the shape of these buildings should be and how much they could each, at each site could take in TDRs. I note that, at least based on the information we were given on Monday, that on its footprint, the 2701 Jackson Avenue um, building will have a, an FAR of 15, a little more than 15, and um, at 2632, it's going to have a, an FAR of almost 38 percent, uh, 38 FAR, which is pretty big. Um, how was it decided how much to send where, and what's the land use rationale for buildings of that scale? You showed us heights um, in a way that sort of fit into the neighborhood, but we also have comments from the community board that the concern of um, uh, adding, um, you know, the, the intensity of use that they will bring and whether the neighborhood infrastructure can support it. So what was the equation that brought those numbers of TDRs? Well, the 66,000 on the north side was all the north side had. Um, so okay, it, so it ended up with a 27-story building. So um, the yeah. discussion on the south side of, ta of eventually getting 296,000 out of the 400 was after extensive discussions with your department, um, Queen's department, going back and forth as to what <laughs> was appropriate from a height point of view. Um, this, is a, this is a sketch of 
what our buildings are. They're the pink buildings, five and six. Mm -hmm. And these are the other um, similar size and some larger buildings in the area. So from an aesthetic point of view, um, the building is, the buildings fit. From an FAR point of view, the zoning lot has an AFAR, as you know. We mer this is no um, upzoning. It's we merged the property with the city's property, and the FAR of the property is eight. It's just that as in any deal between two adjacent parcels, we're just reallocating the floor area. So the footprint FAR might be I mean, the numbers that you state. I'm sure they're correct. You, you have the application in front of you, but just as any project. That, buy, that buys development rights from a neighbor might have an FAR of 50. Um, it's still the zoning lot remains at eight FAR. Yeah, no, I appreciate the legalities, but the re, you know the reality of walking around a building is you look just at the building and how does that building feel? It's going to well, feel like a pretty dense building. It, it, that's why we did this the sketch to show you that yes, it's a big building. One is 49, one is 27, but it's not bigger than money, many of the other buildings in the area. Okay. I um, mean, most of the community's comments, and I was to every community meeting, was not so much that the buildings were tall, but they have infrastructure concerns, and they were concerned about schools, their concerns mostly about schools, and some were concerned about sewers and, and things alike, so that their concern was that, was it worth it to unleash, as you put it earlier today, um, floor area um, when what they were getting was 150 affordable units? And that was an equation that different people might feel differently about. You know, some think it's worth it, and we hope you do as well. But that was with most of the concern. There was almost no comment made that the buildings were too tall. And I'll be glad at the um, we'll be glad at the review session to have the department describe how it looked at the amount of floor area on each of the sites. Good, thank you. And then, could I ask a follow-up question of HPD on this point? We we were given information about this. This is a this is a very unusual, novel approach to city-owned property. Um, but it invited the question about where else in the city this could happen, and we were shown in particular information about additional sites in Long Island City um, that have this potential. Is HPD working on looking at um, monetizing those or, or creating affordable housing on those um, adjacent sites? Yeah, great question. I, all I can say is that currently there's no plans to do uh, RFPs like this one going forward, um, but that could change. Uh, certainly, you know, our mandate at HPD and somewhat generally across the city is to look at all our assets and how we can leverage them for affordable housing, uh, in, in similar in the way that we did here. But there's there's no, we're not cooking up the next scheme right now for an, another RFP like this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your creativity. Um, is there any FAR left from these ramps? Yeah, um, and to, to I, kind I of saw go, it on one side there was a reference to it. You know, um, so you guys will go over this a little bit yeah. in terms of details on the review session. But um, with the south side, it's a large site, the city-owned sending site for the development rights, and in in conversations with the development team, us and city planning, you know, it was clear that it wasn't appropriate to transfer all of those rights, even though the RFP made them all available, it just didn't make sense. So we're, we're saving, we're roughly, we're saving roughly about 100,000 of the 400,000 um, available on the south side. On the north, on the north parcels, we're transferring the entirety. Thank you. Commissioner Marin. So you, do you know of any soft sites on the north side that may be make themselves available to the 100,000? Now, when we put out the RFP, there were some other responses. Uh, like I said, this is the only, these are the, this is the only viable uh, respondent. Um, so our expectation is that really there's no, there's no use for that 100,000 that's left over. This was also part of the presentation at the review session where we identified other parcels um, under ramps that were potentially donating sites, but we found a number of them just not to be practically feasible. Other questions? Then thanks to the applicant team, and we will now turn to speakers in support, uh, beginning with Tachara Adams. And she will be followed by Patrick Smith. Patrick. 
Good afternoon, my name is Tahira. I am here today to testify on behalf of my union, especially the nearly 1,532 BJ members who live and work in Long Island City and Astoria. 32 BJ is the largest property service workers union in the country. Many of us work in residential buildings like the proposed development at 26-32 Jackson Avenue and 27-01 Jackson Avenue. We are confident that Jackson Avenue project will create high quality building service jobs and we want to see it go forward. It is our estimation that when the buildings open, Jackson East and West will be staffed by approximately 25 building service workers. I can't stress enough how important having a good job is, especially for New Yorkers. Fetner Properties, one of the developers on this project, has had a long-standing relationship with 32BJ. They have been proactive in providing the kind of good family, sustaining jobs that uphold the standards building service workers have fought for. The developers have made a commitment to provide good jobs at the Jackson East and West project. We believe they will be an asset to the community and we strongly support their project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Questions? Thank you. We'll then turn to Patrick Smith, who will be followed by Eric Benayin. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Patrick Smith. I live at 1050 Jackson Avenue um, near the uh, subject properties with my wife, uh, my dog, and my uh, young son. Uh, I'm in favor of approving um, both the dispositions and the special permits for these buildings because they would create 150 units of affordable housing. I grew up in an affordable apartment uh, in Manhattan after my parents immigrated from Europe, so I've seen the, um, the benefit and I've experienced the benefit that affordable housing units can create, especially in neighborhoods such as Long Island City where the incomes are much higher. Um, the sites, as far as I can tell, would not displace any residents. The area near the ramp is not pleasing and has a bad feeling at night. Uh, the developments, I think, would activate the streets adjacent to the ramp and make the area more desirable. Mm -hmm. um, as, my, uh, as the person who just spoke uh, mentioned, the development will lead to numerous construction jobs, permanent jobs, and tens of millions of dollars in other economic benefits over the coming years and decades. Are there sensitive topics? Uh, as, as an LIC community member where my son attends school at PS78Q on 5th Street, uh, of course, uh, school services, density, uh, that all needs to be discussed, but I do not think those are uh, reasons for not allowing a project like this to go forward because we desperately need affordable housing in LIC and, and across New York City. I think LIC is probably uh, better suited than many neighborhoods to accommodate these additional housing units because we have eight subway lines, 13 bus lines, multiple ferry stops, and a new 20-acre park. And we love to keep these things a little secret, but I think there is... Uh, more room to grow. Uh, hopefully our past can inform our future. So I'd like to conclude by reading a few sentences from a 1985 New York Times article regarding former Mayor Koch's State of the City address. On housing, Mr. Koch said, the city is facing a serious shortage. He blamed the federal government. His housing plan, which requires the approval of the state, the city planning commission, and local communities, is intended to make affordable housing easier to build. He would make more apartments available for low and middle income New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Questions? And I think you're correct that the secret is out of the bag about what a great place Long Island City is. <laughs> Our next speaker is Eric Benaim, and he will be followed by Mark Lavaya. Hello everyone, my name is Eric Benaim. Uh, I'm a native Queens uh, citizen. I live with my wife and my two-year-old, or soon to be two-year-old uh, son, about a block away from uh, the site. I have also known the Sherian family since 2005. I've also been working on this project as uh, a consultant uh, for the past uh, three years. My company, uh, Modern Spaces, is a local uh, real estate brokerage uh, whose commitment to the neighborhood uh, and growth and um, just uh, really, really uh, passionate about uh, Long Island City. I can say I've worked with uh, Aaron's uh, father and uncle uh, for about 10 years now. Uh, I can't really say enough good words about the people. As Aaron said, their family has uh, historically built condominiums, built them, sold them, and left. Uh, 
Uh, now they're, his father and his uncle are paving the way for him and his cousins, uh, and they're looking to build this building, which is a mix of condos and rentals, and stay. Uh, and with them staying here, they're going to be uh, committed to the neighborhood. Uh, the Fenton organization is another organization that looks to hold property long term. Um, my wife and my son, we walk around this uh, block uh, every other day at least, uh, and the ramp is a little bit, uh, I should say, not uh, pleasant. Uh, so to see them activate this uh, would be really nice. Um, again, I'm full support of this project. Um, that's pretty much it. Thank you, Mr. Benheim. Questions? Okay, then our next speaker will be Mark Lavaya to be followed by Barack Khan. <clears throat> my name is Mark Lavaya. Uh, I lived in Long Island City for over 10 years, and my family has owned property, uh, residential uh, property, and uh, retail commercial property in Long Island City for decades, probably six or seven decades. Um, they've seen the area develop. I'm in support of the buildings. They, my family's seen the area develop, uh, you know, pretty rapidly in the last 15 years, and I think. Um, for the better. I think that, you know, one thing that my family always was concerned about is that the area become very, like, over luxury without, you know, the diversity that the neighborhood has, has traditionally had. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, this development we, is, we approve, or I approve, because one, under the ramps is, is kind of a creepy place to be, and I think this will really make it more accessible for the neighborhood. And, and two, the affordable component. Um, you know, like as seen in like Hunters Point South, you have all these luxury buildings and the affordable apartments there um, that have been put in Hunters Point South really have made a difference to keep the neighborhood sort of, you know, diverse. You're not just getting like, you know, very high income people buying condominiums and sort of investors. You're getting families that have moved in with middle incomes, and it's really made a difference in Hunters Point South, I think, in Court Square. This is, a, is absolutely necessary, or you'll see just luxury, you know, you won't have that same diversity. So that's why we support the, uh, I, I support the, uh, the project. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Mr. Levaya. Our next speaker is Barak Khan, followed by Ovbio Teha. Hi, uh, my name is Burak Khan. Um, I actually own and operate two of the supermarkets in the neighborhood. Uh, we are in favor of the project. I don't know if I can add any more to what's been said here, but it's definitely an eyesore right now. The site is an eyesore. Uh, we definitely need an affordable housing for obvious reasons, and we still believe that there's much more room to develop in this area. And that's all I can say. Thank you. Okay. Questions? Okay, then we will move on to Ovidio Teja. He'll be followed by Brett Swanson. Hi there, my name is Ovidio. Um, I own a houseware and hardware store in Long Island City, and I fully support this project. Uh, as the previous speaker said, Hopefully this project will make the neighborhood look a lot better and fix this eyesore that we pass by every day. And as he said, I don't know if there is much I can say that has been said. We very much appreciate your taking time from the business to come here and testify. We certainly benefit from public testimony. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Okay, our next speaker in support is Brett Swanson, who will be followed by Judith Rosenfeld. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brett Swanson, representing Tom Gretz of the Queen's Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we're writing this letter on behalf of the Queen's Chamber in support of the above referenced land use applications. The Queen's Chamber of Commerce is the oldest and largest business advocacy organization in the borough of Queens. We've achieved a membership of nearly 1,000 organizations representing 90,000 business organizations. Or excuse me, 90,000 based Queens based employees. And I'm testifying in favor of the application, which will create hundreds of good jobs and generate economic activity for the businesses in the Long Island City area. 
And the plan before you allows the city to transfer air rights to create much needed affordable housing by literally creating it out of thin air. The buildings that are created are tall, but in scale are smaller than the above the build, other buildings in the area. The developer, American Lion, includes the Sherian family, which has been responsible has been a responsible Long Island City developer for a long time, and Fetner Properties, a leading developer of affordable housing in the borough as well. We know they've expressed interest in working closely with the residential and business communities to address the issues of infrastructure and open space in the area. Finally, we support the workforce affordable rents that will enable the community to continue to be home to a wide array of working New Yorkers, including uniformed service personnel, school teachers, and medical service employees. Given the cost to build, it is the right economic mix and a good use of the city's otherwise unusable floor area under the ramps. For these reasons, the Queen's Chamber of Commerce wholly, wholeheartedly endorses the project. And for the foregoing reasons, we support the proposed application and request that the City Planning Commission approve the proposed land use applications. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Mr. Swanson. Thank you. Our next speaker in support is Judith Rosenfeld. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Hi, I'm Judith Rosenfeld, um, speaking on behalf of Breaking Ground, which is the largest developer and manager of permanent supportive housing in New York State. So Breaking Ground currently operates 3,700 units of supportive and affordable housing for low-income individuals and families, with 1,100 new apartments in development. So as a result, we have nearly three decades of experience in marketing and tenant selection for affordable projects, and we also manage the lottery and lease up for other developers um, for profit. And um, we would be expected to be the administering agent on this project as well. Um, so in Breaking Ground's experience and, and recent data, which we've discussed, um, this, the need for new housing stock with varying levels of affordability is, is greatly needed. Um, there's a smaller share of rental units citywide, affordable to both low and moderate income households compared to 10 years ago. And that has increased the rent burden as well. People are paying up to 50% of their income in rent. Um, so under the city's affordable income guidelines, at 130% AMI, for a two bedroom, um, a family of four that's making up to 135,000 for a two bedroom, um, their rent would be less than 2,800. The same market rate apartment would be over 4,000. So, and, and as people were saying, these are, these are households, um, they're typically your school teachers, firefighters, and other similar working class individuals, and they're being priced out of their neighborhoods despite being you know, considered middle class or middle income. So um, the HPD's mandatory inclusionary housing workforce option will enable the city to provide the necessary affordable housing to these households. Um, so on behalf of Breaking Ground, thank you for letting me testify, and um, we really appreciate your commitment to providing affordable housing. Thank you, Ms. Rosenfeld. Questions? Whoops. <laughs> You're off the hook. Okay. <laughs> um, those are the only speakers who have signed up to speak on this matter, but if anyone else is present who would like to be heard, please come forward. The public hearing is closed. Citywide, calendar numbers 38 and 39. Calendar number 38, N180349ZRY. Calendar number 39, N180349AZRY. A public hearing in the matter of applications for zoning tax amendments concerning the M1 hotel tax amendment. Notice, a public hearing is being held by the City Planning Commission in conjunction with the above you appearance to receive comments related to a draft environmental impact statement. This hearing is being held pursuant to the State Environmental Quality Review Act and the City Environmental Quality Review. I'll note that as we had the city planning team make a presentation at the review session, there won't be another presentation. We will um, go, we will start with speakers in support and then speakers in opposition, beginning with Armando Moritz Chapeyiken. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lucy Block. I'm going to be uh, providing Armando's testimony on his behalf. Okay, I'm afraid you'll have to sign in separately under your name. Okay, I'm actually down there because I was going to testify on behalf of Daryl Holin. Um, so should I wait until? Yep, if we could wait called? until then. Sure. Thank you. Okay. 
And then we will turn to Lucy Block. <laughs> <laughs> that was, I should have looked ahead and seen that. <laughs> um, good afternoon. So um, Armando had to uh, leave, so I'll be reading his testimony, and then I have his written testimony as well as that of Daryl Holin um, on behalf of the Business Outreach Center. Okay, within Network. three minutes, so the, you're using your time. I'll be reading Armando's testimony. So um, good afternoon. Thank you, commissioners, for the opportunity to testify. Um, I'm Lucy Block. I'm the Policy and Research uh, Associate at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development. I'm uh, providing the testimony of Armando Moritz Chapelikin, who's the Campaign Coordinator for Equitable Economic Development. So um, uh, ANHD is part of the Industrial Jobs Coalition, a citywide alliance of policy advocates, community organizations, and business service providers. Uh, we broadly support the text amendment to restrict hotels in M1 areas across the city. At a time when affordability is a citywide concern, the, product, the proposed text amendment would meaningfully restrict a competing use from industrial areas, making good on the city's commitment to advance use group reform as part of the Industrial Action Plan. The administration already recognizes that industrial and manufacturing jobs, whose average wages are twice that of the retail sector, are a crucial avenue of opportunity and equitable economic development for communities across the city. Unfortunately, there is less and less space for these kinds of jobs as a result of competing uses, making, meaning less space to allow good jobs to be located and grow. Use group reform, especially in the city's 21 industrial business zones, is necessary to ensuring access to good paying jobs across all five boroughs. The proposed text amendment effectively advances this goal. That being said, we do have recommendations to modify and improve upon the existing text amendment. Specifically, we have concerns about the criteria for granting the special permit and the public purpose exemption. We are also supportive of the change to the areas of applicability reflected in the A text. So regarding the special permit criteria, currently the granting of the special permit is contingent upon the City Planning Commission finding that the site plan incorporates elements to address potential conflicts between the proposed use and adjacent uses, the use will not cause vehicular or pedestrian congestion, and that the use will not impair the essential character or future use or development of the surrounding area. We believe that the language around essential character should be strengthened to consider how proposed development would impact the real estate market in the area. As we've seen in manufacturing across the city, competing uses have played a role in speculation where a single hotel can reshape the real estate landscape for an area that would otherwise be more affordable for industrial and manufacturing development. On the public purpose exemption, the proposed tax amendment currently exempts any transient hotel allocated, uh, sorry, operated for a public purpose. This raises a significant question. How much of a transient hotel is required to be allocated for a public purpose before it triggers this exemption? If a commercial hotel developer can plan to enter into a contract with the city or state to provide one room for a public purpose and avoid the restriction established by this text amendment, that would be a major loophole um, in the text amendment's language. The language around the public purpose exemption must be more specific to indicate how much of a hotel must be allocated for a public purpose, whether as a percentage or total number of rooms before the exemption is triggered. On the areas of applicability, the original hotel text amendment ex excluded the M1 areas around LaGuardia and JFK airports. Given the city's existing commitment to restrict competing uses in the IBZs, most recently in its action to restrict self-storage, it is crucial that the proposed action to restrict hotels applies the same standard to manufacturing districts in all IBZs. We're pleased that the ATEX version of the hotel text amendment makes these areas subject to the special permit. This revision reinforces the need for a comprehensive zoning approach to all of our city's IBZs. We support the city's effort to reform the zoning in our industrial areas. Restricting hotels in the M1 areas is a necessary step to tackling the speculation that's making it harder for manufacturers to stay in the city. Should Thank you. Who and if I you could the submit the statistics? copies to the secretary, she'll get them to us. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Block? Okay, our next speaker will be in support is Peter Spencer. Hi, good afternoon. I'm, uh, I'm actually just going to enter into record the uh, testimony on behalf of uh, Councilman Stephen Matteo, who represents a, a district that is uh, affected by this, a large uh, man manufacturing district. <clears throat> so thank you for the opportunity to offer my thoughts on DCP application number N180349ZRY, which would establish a new special permit under the jurisdiction of the City Planning Commission for new hotels motels, tourist cabins, and boatels in light manufacturing districts citywide. Like the Staten Island Borough Board, I support application number N180349ZRY with the following proviso. I support the vesting of existing and future hotel uses situated on the South Avenue Corporate Park, which is located in my district, 
and believe it is appropriate to exempt the Staten Island Industrial Park campus from the new special permit requirements. Those who grew up on Staten Island remember the current corporate park location to be a desolate area. Drag races were the most common occurrence on that stretch of South Avenue at night, and the wooded areas were used to illegally dump all kinds of goods, including entire vehicles. The development that has taken place in this area has transformed it into one of Staten Island's preeminent business centers. Central to that incredible transformation was the construction and operation of the two hotels on the campus. By establishing this new special permit, CPC contemplates a case-by-case -case and site-specific review process to ensure hotel development occurs on appropriate sites, analyzing potential for conflicts with surrounding uses and whether the hotel reflects the general character of a surrounding area. In this case, it is clear from recent history that the long existing hotels actually enhance the other uses in the area, and they do reflect the general character of the area since their existence helps shape that character. For these reasons and others, it is appropriate to exempt the Staten Island Industrial Park campus from the new special permit requirements. Thank you for your time, courtesy, and consideration. And I believe you have copies as well, right? Wait, okay. Good. Thank you. We'll get copies of all of the testimony that is submitted. Okay. Questions? Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker in support is Ian Dunford. Good afternoon. My name is Ian Dunford, and I'm here today to speak on behalf of the New York Hotel Trades Council, the union representing 35,000 women and men working in hotels across New York City. Our members are the heart of the hospitality industry, which serves as one of the city's key economic engines. The union has closely monitored the hotel development boom that has occurred over the last decade, and we are keenly aware of the large number of hotels that have been built in manufacturing zones across the city. We believe that this type of hotel development is imbalanced and out of context. Since 2005, hotels have been built in areas of the city that no one would have imagined. This development has been, in many cases, in direct conflict with the various public land use plans and policies of these communities. And local communities have responded with calls for the city to put a stop to hotel towers rising next to homes or replacing once thriving light manufacturing businesses taking away manufacturing jobs from hardworking New Yorkers. Furthermore, we believe that the proliferation of hotels and manufacturing zones is ultimately not good for the city's tourism economy. We've already seen the negative effects of oversaturation borne out in recent declines in average daily rate and revenues per available room. A special permit requirement for hotels is a proper tool to ensure that another boom of out-of-context hotel development does not occur, and we are heartened that the city agrees, as is witnessed in the inclusion of hotel special permit language in various recent rezonings, most notably in the East Midtown rezoning, where hotel special permits will serve the city's aim to revitalize the area with world-class office development. The New York Hotel Trades Council supports the city's proposed requirement of a special permit for hotels in light manufacturing zones. The union believes that it is most sensible means of ensuring that any new hotel development fits within the context of its surrounding community and guarantees that when developers seek to build hotels in manufacturing zones, all stakeholders have a seat at the table. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Dunford? Yes, Commissioner Delos. Uh, thanks for being here. Since, since you mentioned that um, the, there's data about the proliferation of hotels impacting the average daily room rate, I'm just wondering, if, if that data is able to separate out the impact on the average daily room rate from Airbnb versus the proliferation of hotels. I don't know if you happen to know that. But. Let me see if I understand this right. You're, you're asking if we can attribute yeah. the decline yes. of like ADR and yeah. RevPAR. I think there actually have been studies regarding that. Okay. So, you know, if, if that's something you're interested in, we probably have that data and we could provide if it If you, you happen to have it, I, I, I'm just curious, especially since you raised it. Um, I mean, I'm, I certainly share many of the concerns that you just shared. So. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Dunford. Thank you. We will now, we'll now turn to speakers in opposition, beginning with Jean Kaufman. <clears throat> um, good afternoon, Commission. It's Gene Kaufman, architect. I'm going to start with a quote from what Politico says about this rezoning proposal. Um, quote, the Hotel Trades Council is poised for another policy victory, a special permit which gives the union leverage in negotiating with hotel developers. 
putting them at the mercy of a legislative body that has been increasingly beholden to the union, end quote. I think this is the elephant in the room because rezoning as proposed has, has no merit, in my opinion, as planning policy. Manufacturing jobs in the city have dropped by over 90% since 1950 and are now only 2% of the workforce, but M districts still comprise 14% of the land. Hotels and construction in M1 are less than 1% of the buildable area in M1 districts. So who can say that hotels are taking away opportunities from other permitted uses? The study for this proposal has rampant omissions and faulty reasoning. At a minimum, the vote should be delayed until the analysis can be corrected. Incredibly, it claims that the 24,200 rooms in the no action in construction pipeline will provide nearly 90% of all hotel rooms needed over the next 10 years and therefore predicts that hotel development will drop by 90%. This rezoning attempts to prohibit what the report says will happen anyway. In this report, no distinction is made between M16 10 FAR districts in Manhattan and M11 1 FAR districts in Queens. No distinction is made between areas where hotel rates are $150 or less or where they're $500 or more. Banning affordable M1 hotels in Brooklyn and Queens and forcing new hotels into the expensive Manhattan market means new hotel rooms will be only for the wealthy. Therefore, this proposal discriminates against not only 62.8 million visitors and the businesses that depend upon them, it discriminates against middle-class Americans, minorities, people of color who will be priced out of coming to New York City. Instead, it is a gift to hotel owners who will increase their prices to astronomical levels, aided by last week's ban on, on Airbnb, which increased demand by 30,000 rooms, which are not factored into this report. Pairing a ban on hotels with eliminating public review for homeless shelters will give rise to a wave of new homeless shelters in M1. The state of concern about neighborhood and streetscape is ironic because most M11 and M12 districts are predominantly eyesores, one-story warehouses, empty lots, and abandoned wreck cars. Since special permits were required in Tribeca and Midtown East, not a single hotel room has been proposed or built. Therefore, Thank the you, record Mr. is Kaufman. clear. Special permits for hotels means no hotels. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Kaufman? Yes, Vice Chair Knuckles. Well, you've uh, got a lot packed into three minutes, Mr. Kaufman. Uh, take a lot. Ninety-seven percent of what I was going to say. Okay, um, and uh, I think there's a lot to address there, but uh, certainly at the outset, and I think you realize this: this is not a ban. This is merely a pause to consider uh, the impact of a proposed development on uh, M1 districts across the city. So it's, you know, obviously not accurate to characterize it as a ban. Um, I, I think what I was, was, when I got caught off, what I was trying to, to say is that the um, areas where special permits have been introduced for hotels have resulted in zero hotels. So it's not technically a ban, it's still permitted by special permit, but the effective uh, uh, result has been that no, no hotel rooms have been built. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Marin. You mentioned um, hotels use as shelters. Do you have data? that tells us how many hotels or the percentage of rooms in hotels in M1 districts that have been built that are used for shelters and not for hotel, not for the hotel specific, you specifically intended? I don't have that information, but I do know that the city has been trying to buy a number of hotels in M1 districts, particularly in Long Island City, to use as shelters. They've been actively in that process. I don't have that specific information. I imagine you would have that better than I would. I also know that um, a number of the hotels in, in, in Queens in particular, but other neighborhoods, um, have 100% occupancy many nights because um, DHS uh, fills all the available beds uh, with homeless. Um, so the hotel is actually a functioning transient hotel, but has homeless people staying in it. And I don't have statistics in either of those, but I could look for those and try to provide them. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Levin. 
Uh, Mr. Kaufman, I know you've worked with a whole host of hotel developers and probably know better than many people in this city about um, how these uh, more affordable hotels get developed. One of the arguments that the city is making to us um, in, in support for justifying this um, application has to do with the challenges of locating hotels in areas, industrial areas that have relatively few services for tourists. Um, what's your experience in developing um, these kinds of hotels and what effort um, the um, hotel owners or operators, I realize they're all, you know, franchisees or licensees, um, take to ensure that neighborhood services will be provided for their clients? So um, I, I'll answer that in two parts. Um, as I pointed out, there are a lot of uh, M16, 10 FAR, Manhattan right. sites. No, These I'm, are areas yeah. that have all those services. Right. But the areas that, that say in Long Island City, which seems to come up a lot in the conversation, um, this area has had relatively little in the way of services, although as we've seen with a lot of the other resonance in Long Island City in the past, a lot of things have come into this area. Um, that being said, um, the hotels have actually been um, moving into areas that are away from those services, uh, as you point out. Um, that being you know, the case, um, they have very good subway access to Manhattan. And I think that uh, what they're doing is, and, and almost all hotels provide breakfast for, for the guests. And face it, people don't come to New York City to stay in their hotel room. So people uh, get up, they have breakfast, they get on the subway, they go to wherever they're going. And they come home probably at the end of the day, after dinner, after a Broadway show, after a bar, and they go to sleep. So this sort of lack of services has not been a problem. And I think that uh, what happens is that these hotels have really uh, been a godsend to people who can't afford those Manhattan prices. And they're willing to give up some of the things they might have had in a location where there are more services, but would cost a lot more money. Okay. And then what about the argument that there are quality of life problems um, when you locate hotel uh, resident, you know, hotel guests in a neighborhood surrounded by active industrial uses with noise and street traffic and do, do hotel guests show up and get disappointed that they're that it's maybe noisy at 3 a.m. and um, actually, in a lot of these neighborhoods, there's very little activity. There are a lot of unused properties. Um, so actually, when you're out on the street, you don't really see much of that. There is some noise, and there, there, there are you know things that which are being produced, which maybe you wouldn't want in your neighborhood. But we have not had pushback on this at all, and uh, has not been a problem. And I'll just point to, let's say, the MX districts, where there's active effort to mix residential, hotel, and manufacturing uses in the same neighborhood. So um, you have all of the loft laws, which allow people to live in M1, okay? So uh, again, it's not the perfect environment for, but it's very adequate and much more than adequate for, for, for the guests who come here. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Kaufman. Our next speaker in opposition will be Jiang Gu. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jiang. I uh, represent a development company in uh, Manhattan. We're developing a hotel currently in the uh, demolition process. So I wanted to talk to you guys about tourism and how important it is to New York City. Everybody knows we have 63 million visitors every year. That's four times Paris, three times London. We are one of the best cities in the world to visit. Tourists bring a lot of money into the city, $42 billion spent last year, and that number is going to keep on increasing. One out of every four dollars a tourist spends in New York City, they spend on lodging, right? One out of four. That means the other three dollars are going towards other things, restaurants, bars. And that just helps create more jobs in New York City for everybody else. Now, they say that rev par is going down, and that's a problem. Well, I mean, that's a problem for the hotel developer to deal with. It's not for the city to deal with. If the average room rate goes down, instead of spending you know, one out of every four dollars on lodging, maybe it's one out of every five, one out of every six, that's more money going towards bars, restaurants, honest, hardworking New Yorkers, right? I mean, if hotels actually have a problem with room rates, then people will stop developing hotels. You don't need a special permit to restrict them. You talk about 
uh, the future we want for this city. And we want to build a city that is welcoming to everybody, for everyone to come. What, what do I hope for? I hope that hotel rooms are 150 a night or 100 a night, and you get a nice big hotel room. Because I remember five years ago, before this big boom, you got like a broom closet for $400. Now you can get a nice, comfortable two bedroom or you know, even a one bedroom. You can bring your whole family over for 500 a night. And that's important to all the tourists in America and especially overseas because an overseas visitor spends four times as much money as somebody from the US. And that emerging global middle class, it's increasing astronomically in China, India, Brazil. They all want to come over here. They don't want to come to London. They don't want to come to Paris. They want to come over to New York. And when we get compared up against London, against Paris, the first thing they look at is airfare. The second thing they look at is how much a hotel room costs every night. And if we can offer them a beautiful hotel room at 150, 200 a night, they're gonna wanna come here, they're gonna bring their dollars here. People are gonna come from all over the world to New York City to spend their money. And that's good for everyone, that creates more jobs. You look at the jobs created in restaurants, in bars, in hospitality. For example, retail jobs. A lot of stores say 50% of the retail dollars spent are from visitors. A lot of you know theaters, entertainment. This is what, they wanna live in Manhattan, you know, just for a week maybe two weeks to get a little taste of what we have here, what's special. And I think it's imperative that we let it be affordable for everyone instead of restricting it like this. Thank you for your very vivid testimony, Mr. Vu. Um, questions? Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker in opposition will be Paimon Lodi. Good afternoon, my name is Payman Lothi um, with the Real Estate Board of New York. Rebney strongly opposes the proposed M1 hotel tax amendment that would significantly limit as of right hotel development citywide. It has been the experience of our members that this requirement of a special permit has been deterrent to new hotel development and the draft scope of work in fact states that the proposal will limit the land area of as of right hotel development by 45%. The proposal claims that the zoning in the M1 district gives hotels a competitive advantage over most other permitted uses and detracts from opportunities for other kinds of development. Yet there is insufficient data to support these claims and in fact the market shows that this is not the case. Over the course of the past few years, the city has often applied a hotel special permit on both public and private applications throughout the city, including central locations like East Midtown and the Garment District, where hotel development should be encouraged. Rather than continuing with this piecemeal and opaque approach to regulating new hotels, the, sh the city should state its position on as of right hotel development. Further, the city needs to undertake a comprehensive study of the impact of recent land use actions on the hotel industry, instead of the segmented analysis provided in the city's hotel study. We ask the Planning Commission to consider the following alternatives to the proposal. The city should exclude, one, the city should exclude areas that have special zoning provisions that already consider and address location-specific conditions and needs. Two, exclude Manhattan from the hotel special permit. Three, the city should consider an alternative based on the number of room keys. And four, finally, the city should consider limiting the applicability of the hotel special permit to us, date certain in the future. The hotel industry is a critical linchpin to our city's tourism economy, and it is vital that hotel development not be constrained. In total, the 60 million tourists a year sustains more than 375,000 jobs across the city. These figures are expected to rise as 1.5 million additional tourists are estimated to visit next year. The proposed action is an unnecessary constraint on the rights of property owners to address a market condition that needs no correction and appears to be motivated by factors unrelated to sound planning. It is unclear why the city is advancing a proposal that will impose heavy restrictions on hotel development and the hotel study submitted fails to make a case for its need. We respectfully request that the City Planning Commission not support the zoning proposal in its current form. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Lodi. Commissioner Eady. Good afternoon. Um, Mr. Kaufman also mentioned that in areas where a special permit is required, there are no hotels being developed. Can you speak to why that is? 
Um, I can't speak to specific locations, but I think the, the alternative that we were that, that was proposed here is that, you know, the city has already created a location specific special district, you know, taking into account what type of uses should go there. And it doesn't really make sense to apply an additional special permit on top of that. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Cirillo. In, in the sort of the list of alternatives, you talked about, I, I, I'm gonna phrase it as a different effective date in the future, can you just clarify what you said? Because yeah. I was trying to write. So, so in the hotel study, right. it said that the hotel boom that we are experiencing right now is a result of uh, a lack of hotel development from my, 1997 to 2007. And that the hotel study you know, predicts that as uh, supply catches up with demand, this will reach some sort of equilibrium and you, know, you wouldn't have this hotel development boom that we're experiencing right now. So doesn't it make sense to limit this special permit to you know a date certain in the future, assuming okay. that this is gonna ebb at some point? Okay, thank you. Other questions? Thank you again. Thank you. Our final speaker in opposition is Robin Kramer. Good afternoon, Chair Lago and members of the Commission. My name is Robin Kramer, partner at Duval and Stackenfeld. I'm here on behalf of 26 West 39th LLC, the owner of the property at 26-30 West 39th Street in Manhattan, where my client is developing a new hotel. This will be a 299-room hotel, boutique hotel with restaurant and several bars. The property is located in M16 district. If the proposed hotel special permit amendment is adopted, my client is likely to not continue developing its hotel. My client began assembling the sites and lots and air rights for the hotel in February 2014, completing the assemblage in 2016, started filing for approvals from the DOB in December 2016, and has been working since then on constructing the hotel. It obtained its zoning approval for the hotel in February of this year and its foundation permit this week. Part of the, much of the delay or the length of time was due to the fact that its architect who had designed the hotel went out of business in the middle of this process. The proposed text amendment provides that unless a permit for development is obtained by April 23rd, the hotel cannot be constructed without a special permit. There are vesting provisions in the zoning resolution, but we do not know if we can take advantage of them. A question was asked about why no hotels. Special permits are not guaranteed. If the April 23rd date in the proposed text is not changed and we cannot vest under section 1133, my client is likely to cease construction given the additional costs as to on, on, on the time and other costs in going through the Euler process and there's no certainty it will ever get a special permit. Client will have lost four years of work and all the money spent on the project. But the city will have also lost. The state controller's office has stated that the leisure and hospitality industry accounted for one fifth of the city's job growth since 2009. This hotel alone would have required approximately 200 construction workers and 300 employees in the hotel operations, food service and related industries. City's tax loss would be about $5 million annually. Neither the DEIS nor the hotel study demonstrate a need for the special permit in Manhattan, much less such a, a special permit that would outweigh the losses to my client. It assumed a growth rate of 1.7 annually in the number of visitors, but the city controllers offered issue report for the first quarter of this year showing a growth rate of 4.7%. The DEIS assumes that there would be no reduction in the number of hotels by requiring a special permit and didn't analyze the impact on tourism or alternatives like Airbnb from creating a special permit. There is certainly likely to be at least one less hotel. My client has been working on constructing this hotel for more than four years, beginning long before the city first released its proposal to require a special permit. It has invested significant sums of money in the process and should be allowed to continue construction where there is no evidence that a special permit is needed in mid-Manhattan to limit hotels. Thank you, Ms. Kramer. Thank you for the opportunities to speak to you. Commissioner Efron. Thank you. Ms. Kramer, uh, do you advise clients as to how much it costs to go through a special permit process? Absolutely. And what would that be? Uh, half a million to a million dollars between legal fees, environmental reports, um, 
those are the big costs. Thank you. I, I mean, there are projects where it's cost significantly more than a million dollars, um, and there are projects where it has cost less than half a million dollars. Um, but you know, if you would ask me for a reasonable estimate, that would be my reasonable estimate. Vice Chair Knuckles. I'm just curious, is um, this the first hotel development that your client is uh, pursuing? No. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Ms. Kramer. Thank you. So those are the only folks who have signed up to speak on this matter, but if others feel so moved, now would be the time to come forward. <laughs> Well, I will note that the record on this matter is going to remain open for 10 days to receive comments on the draft environmental impact statement. So the record will be open through Monday, the 6th of August of this year. And with that, the public hearing is closed. And Madam Secretary, yes, Commissioner Marina, I'm sorry. If I may, I'd just, I, I just like to, to make a statement. Um, I have troubled troubles with this proposal. And I've stated that from the beginning, and specifically, as this proposal affects um, city-owned or operated transient hotels. And I believe that the policy by which we house the homeless does tie into this proposal, and I think that needs to be studied further, because I, I understand that we have to house our, house our homeless. We haven't touched on that on, on here, because this is a special permit for hotels, but it is a fact that the city is using hotels to house the homeless. And this proposal would basically, and I know it, it happens now, would exempt um, city-owned or operated transit hotels from having any sort of public review. And I don't think, in my opinion, that the accommodations for the homeless that are being made in these M1 districts is, is palatable to me. And I think that this is, it's affected by this whole process. And I just want the record to state that I think that the policy by which we do this needs to be revisited. And this administration really needs to take a look at this. Thank you, Commissioner Marin. You've been very clear on this before and your interest and passion for the um, issue is, is evident. And so, um, Madam Secretary, any other business? No, Madam Chair. Okay, we're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay.